Could you please be seated? Uh, I'm going to be seated and I suggest that through uh, the meeting we remain seated rather than stand as is customary uh, given the particular circumstances at this moment. We invite you in just a moment to stand. But I think it might be appropriate that we meet for the first time in such a long while with all that has happened in our city over those months. But we thought just for a moment of reflection, the time that has been so costly, so painful, to remember those who have been bereaved, to give thanks to those who stepped forth, and particularly for our volunteers and frontline staff. Just a moment of reflection before we begin this evening. I invite you to stand. <laughs> Thank you. So we're under start. I'd like to welcome everyone to my first council meeting as Lord Mayor. First meeting of full council since December 2019. All members have been able to attend in person. Uh, as usual, I'm glad to say this meeting will be a webcast. Which means the residents and other members of the public have the chance to see it live. Thank you. Have the chance to see it live or to view it on demand at a later date if they wish. Uh, the venue instructions for this meeting have been published on the council's website. Uh, this includes the need to wear face coverings when moving around communal areas, uh, with the exception of this room and when seated. Face coverings within this room can be worn at your discretion. In the very unlikely event we need to evacuate this space, uh, we simply head straight out of the doors, back outside, and then we gather there. As usual, I would remind everyone to continue to behave respectfully, appropriately. I'd like us to have a good, productive debate tonight. Please play fairly and with as many members as possible having the opportunity to have their say. And I'd also like to remind members at this stage that the guillotine will fall three hours and 40 minutes after the start of the meeting to ensure that we reach agenda item 14 before the guillotine falls. I intend to vary the order of the agenda to bring that item forward so that it will be dealt with immediately after item 11. I intend to have one break during our meeting at an appropriate point, about 90 minutes into this meeting, and to break for 15 minutes. Again, please refer to the venue instructions for uh, coronavirus guidance and adhere to this during the break. Is all that understood? Thank you. Then we move straight on with our meeting, which I look forward to being clear and constructive. First of all, with apologies, uh, I have already received apologies this evening from Councillors Baker and Heaton, also from Councillor D. Taylor. Do members have any further apologies to report? I see none, thank you. I do appreciate that being here this evening is for many, uh, well, for all of us, strange, for many, challenging, and I fully respect that. Um, can I ask members and officers, of course, to turn off mobile phones? I'll make sure my phone is switched off, or at least in silent mode. And uh, other electronic equipment is not used during the duration of this council meeting. 
Can I remind everyone as usual to speak clearly during debate, to use your microphones. Uh, you'll need to press the speaker sign in the center, uh, which will illuminate in red. Uh, the speakers will, uh, speaker system will allow only uh, me plus uh, up to three further speakers to be registered at any one time. So please indicate if you wish to speak by raising your hand, not a virtual hand on this occasion, and I will then call upon you to speak at the appropriate time. As I've already said, uh, I think appropriate that we remain uh, seated on this occasion. Uh, to help us get through business effectively tonight, I'd be grateful if you would keep the meeting focused to the point, and I'll do my best to help us to do that as we go along. So firstly, uh, declarations of interest. May I ask all members who have a personal, prejudicial, or disclosable pecuniary interest in any of the business to be discussed tonight, please declare your interest now if you haven't already done so in advance on the register of interests. I see one or two hands. Councillor Mason, I've seen. Is that on? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the uh, access for all motion, I'm uh, registered blind and have a blue badge, so I've been given advice not to uh, take part in that, so I'll leave the room at that point. Thank you. Thank you, that's understood. And I think Councillor Lomas? Yeah, I think it is. Yes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have an interest to declare because I am disabled and I have a blue badge. My view is that this is a personal interest, but no more prejudicial than, for example, someone who cycles participating in a debate on improving cycling infrastructure. I have, however, been advised by the monitoring officer that I should recuse myself from the debate, as in her view, this is a prejudicial interest because she believes the blue badge to be a service that I receive. I do not view it that way. My blue badge is a reasonable adjustment which enables me to participate in daily life on a level playing field with others who are not disabled. To prevent me from participating in this debate is to treat me differently directly because of a disability, and this is discrimination. It cannot be that the code of conduct excludes people from debate on the grounds of a protected characteristic. Is the monitoring officer advising anyone who might use or have benefited from social care that they have a prejudicial interest in motion three or anyone who might use planning services that they have a prejudicial interest in motion one? Would a woman be advised that she cannot take part in a debate on women's rights? Would a person of colour be advised that they could not take part in a debate on racism? I take my responsibility in public life seriously. So in the absence of other, any other option, I will not participate in the debate, but I want the public to understand why and to see how I am being directly discriminated against and silenced and prevented from participating in a debate that I believe I should be able to participate in. One of the basic principles of disability campaigning is nothing about us without us. And this council is shamefully, purposefully excluding a disabled councillor from this debate. I call on the Lord Mayor now to intervene and use the power and privilege he is afforded in his position to avoid this direct discrimination in a meeting he is presiding over. Councillor Lomas, thank you for that. I have listened carefully to uh, your very well articulated uh, objection, and I, I do sympathize enormously. But on this occasion, I've had no opportunity to uh, consider that before this moment, um, and I'm reluctant, as you have sought advice, to immediately go against that. I've listened carefully, and I think there may be something here that we need to consider for future occasions, but I think at this moment, uh, I accept your, uh, your decision not to participate in that particular item on our agenda. I think also Councillor Norman indicated. Am I uh, wrong? Yes, Lord Mayor, I have been advised by monitoring officer um, that as an employee of 
uh, NRS Healthcare Limited. Uh, I have a personal pecuniary interest um, in that same agenda item and therefore won't be participating in that debate. Thank you. Thank you for that. No others I've noticed. Thank you. That's uh, item one. Item two, approval of minutes. Um, since a while since we've done this, do I have members approval to sign the minutes for the ordinary council meeting held on the 22nd of March 2021, the extraordinary meeting held on the 4th of May 2021, and the annual meeting held on the 27th of May 2021? I see one hand at the back there. Councillor Pavlovic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In respect of the minute of the 4th of May, the Extraordinary Council, I'd like to see clari seek clarification on the interest declared by Councillor Aston. On the meeting webcast at approximately nine minutes, he stated that he declared an interest and received dispensation to participate in the debate in his role as leader of the council. He didn't make clear what the interest was. And I note that all other members involved in the staffing matters and urgency decision relating to the decision to remove the former chief executive had declared that that was their personal interest, save for Councillor Aspden. The reason that this is relevant, Lord Mayor, is because the minutes as recorded on page 29 of our papers state that he declared a prejudicial and or disclosable pecuniary interest on the grounds that he was, and I quote, a respondent in the employment tribunal claim referred to in the PIR. Whilst the minute as recorded is clearly inaccurate in that Councillor Aston didn't clarify what his interest was, only that one existed, could he now clarify if the minute as recorded was the interest he declared? Secondly, in respect of the same in respect of the same minutes, um, and on the topic uh, on the topic of accurate recording of interests and dispensations, the meeting heard that the monitoring officer and chair of standards had surprisingly provided dispensation to the whole executive on a motion that hadn't yet been submitted published or tabled at the meeting. This detail is missing from the meeting minutes and we'd request that it is added before they are approved. And finally, Lord Mayor, on page 33, Councillor Wells um, is down as voting both for and against the motion and for transparency she was unequivocally against and Councillor Fitzpatrick not voting at all. Equally, she voted against. Therefore, the Labour Group cannot vote to approve the 4th of May minutes until both the clarification of the interest and the voting records are agreed to be amended. Okay. You don't. Please bear with us just for a moment. Lord thank Mayor, you. I'm going, I'm going to ask uh, if you would just clarify that uh, dispensation issue. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. There is an inaccuracy in the minutes. Um, the dispensation that was uh, granted um, 
uh, by myself in consultation with the chair of the Joint Standards Committee was in respect of the leader of the council and the members of the executive. So that does need correcting at the bottom of um, page 29 on my agenda. So that aspect does need um, amending, Lord Mayor. And presumably the other item that was referred to is uh, fairly straightforward as a correction. Yes, in respect of the voting record, which Councillor Pavlovic has raised on page 32, absolutely there's a typographical error in that Councillor Wells' name does appear twice in both columns. And just to confirm, I spoke earlier with um, Councillor Pavlovic and the error is that Councillor Wells is recorded as voted for. So that, that amendment will, she be removed, her name will be removed from that column and that Councillor Fitzpatrick's name is entirely absent from the list and I've spoken with Councillor Pavlovic and Councillor Fitzpatrick's name will appear in the against column. Um, that is, is Councillor Pavlovic was kind enough to bring that to my attention prior to the start of this meeting. So just for accuracy, that is the reflection that will be made in the minutes. Thank you. Councillor Pav Pavlovic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so just from what um, the monitoring officer has said, um, the, the bit just below the bottom in respect of the dispensation um, was that Councillor Aston actually had declared a specific interest. Is that to be removed? Lord Mayor, if I may. Yes. It is, it is correct that uh, Councillor Aspen declared an interest, but there is no requirement for a member to, dip, to put forward reasons as to why they've got the interest. So Councillor Aspen um, did declare in the meeting that he had an interest and that is recorded. And um, I would probably need to just clarify the description of the interest, but having um, observed the with the video, the recording of the meeting, there wasn't a reason given, and Councillor Aston is not required to give a reason. He's just required to declare that he's got an interest in an item. So, Thank you. just for the absolute transparency and, and accuracy, that reason is to be removed from the final published minutes. Um, yes, that reason will be taken out, but it will still reflect that Councillor um, Aston did declare an interest. No, no, that's granted. Granted, it, it was just the actual reason. Thank you. It sounds like we can now move on. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead, Councillor. Mine's much less interesting, Lord Mayor. It probably caused a lot less confusion. Uh, on page 37, I believe it's probably a typographical error, but something has happened after the Heweth Ward. So Councillor Douglas has annexed my ward. And then everybody else from the council has subsequently annexed everyone else's ward. So I am down as a councillor for Holgate Ward, Councillor Melly for Hull Road, Councillor Muston and Norman have taken over Huntington. Councillors Corwick, Ole and Runciman made an aggressive move on Micklegate. <laughs> and Councillor Corshaw and Kilburn are probably very much enjoying their time in Osbaldwick and Derwent. So I think basically everything after Haxby needs to go up one. And clearly I'm the only one that read the minutes follow. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Eyre. Thank you. We will correct that. Having noted all of those things, I don't see anybody else indicating. Uh, can I then ask, just by a show of hands, that we approve the, the minutes of those meetings as now corrected? Thank you. Those against? I see no one indicating otherwise. Thank you very much. Those minutes will be signed off. Civic announcements. Um, I'm delighted to um, say that uh, only this afternoon, um, the Civic Party en enjoyed the Great Yorkshire Show and just happened to bump into Prince Charles, who asked how things were in York. So I did my best to answer his question. He said, I haven't been to York for a long while. I said, then it's probably time you paid another visit. He said, well, maybe I should. I've just become patron of the York Minster Fund. I said, even better reason to come back to York soon. So uh, hopefully we, we, might get, um, we might get a royal visit. Uh, only yesterday, I was delighted um, with the Lady Mayoress to entertain Commander Giles Palin of the Royal Navy uh, of HMS Dragon, who very kindly presented the emblem of HMS Dragon, which is on the table with the sword. And Mace, if you would care to take a look at it uh, later. 
Um, HMS York was affiliated to the city, but is now decommissioned. And it is HMS Dragon, which has taken on that affiliation. No other English city or town has that affiliation with HMS Dragon. And uh, he is very keen that we, uh, we really make, uh, make the most of that connection. Uh, so I was delighted to welcome that on your behalf, on behalf of the city uh, yesterday. Thirdly, finally, uh, the Lord Mayor's charities. It won't surprise you, events have been somewhat difficult to organize, but on Monday evening, we have the first of those uh, on the Sky Bar of Mount Maison, York. And if you'd like further detail, it will be, uh, it will be available. We now come to public participation, and uh, we have a number of speakers this evening. Um, two of our public speakers today will be participating in person, uh, the remainder by phone. I intend to take the speakers in the order of the items on our agenda this evening. Those who are speaking in person are seated in the public seating area. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I will invite each in turn to come to the microphone uh, across on my far left. Uh, each will then return to their seat when they've finished at the end of the session. They may either stay for the remainder of the meeting or leave if they wish. Those participating remotely will be dialed into the meeting by the technical team after speaking, they will be asked to hang up before I introduce the next speaker. Speakers cannot participate any further in the meeting, but are welcome to continue watching by viewing the live webcast. As I say, nine speakers this evening, each will have a maximum of three minutes to address us or to ask a question on any matter directly relevant to our business. So I call upon our first speaker, Gwen Swinburne, who's here in person, and I'd like to ask her to speak, she would like to speak on matters within the remit of full council. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Lomas, I was shocked that what you had to say. Um, you certainly should have had the chance to speak in my opinion. Lord Mayor, governance under this administration has gone from concerning to frankly catastrophic. The core of our governance, particularly democratic services, joint standards, HR, complaints, and information governance are no longer fit for purpose. Meetings are called unlawfully, even the annual council. Agendas and what now counts for minutes appear, then disappear, are changed somehow and reappear. Years of FOIs in the so-called disclosure log have been airbrushed from history members kept in the dark. Even basic proportionality is wrong. Joint standards has become a laughing stock. It's as if top management consider the council a private club and members simply superfluous to be treated differently according to their place in the pecking order. Recent failures are too, man too many to mention, but the play park debacle reflects a further governance inequality that has never been addressed since unitary status. The inner wards have no local governance arrangements, unlike York Outer, hence almost no democratic voice, institutional capacity or match funding. The Lib Dem competition pots simply divert resources from areas of the city most in need to the wealthy outer wards now under Lib Dem control. The whole process should be audited at the least. It's a perfect candidate for a judicial review. Lord Mayor, the only reference to governance on the Lib Dem manifesto was a promise to return us to a committee system. I am told officers say they are too busy. I say outsource it. There is plenty of money to get staff and consultants when those same officers want something. My formal question, we are two years in, not a word on the committee system. Have you dropped it? And hence your only governance commitment. Finally, on the top salaries item. You have been provided with only a percentage of staff costs in these papers. Our citizens audit has exposed a further 10 staff, each costing us over 100,000 pounds each. The head of waste billed 141,000. The head of HR cost us 108,000. 
Nearly 1.1 million for 10 staff not declared in your papers. You're coming towards the end of your time, just a few seconds. Please. Thank you. One paragraph. We have identified a further 26 staff billing over £50,000, four of them over 90000 That's another 1.85 million not declared here. I guess up to 15 million or more is spent on these many other off books staff with Thank almost you. zero mem member oversight. You have Thank to you take much. back control. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your comments have been noted. I'll call upon our second speaker, uh, Henri Alderman and Reid. Would like to speak on item eight one on the agenda a motion on a planning system that works for residents thank you lord mayor for the opportunity to speak in support of the motion condemning the government's planning reforms although there is room to reform the present system these latest proposals will satisfy nobody except of course developers Whole swathes of Greenbelt land will be designated for housing, with no opportunity for local residents or councils to have any further input. The persistent creep of amendments to permitted development rights has also eroded the right to object, or the possibility for councils to impose conditions that will protect existing or proposed residents. All this is because, apparently, local councils are not granting enough planning permissions. The evidence doesn't support that assumption. The LGA estimate that there are over 1.1 million unimplemented permissions nationwide. In York, the total net unimplemented consents on the 1st of April 2020 was 8,201. Of those, a total of 1,912 net additional homes are on non-allocated sites, but there are 5,388 on allocated sites in the local plan with full or outline consent. Obviously, work has started on some of those sites, but there are many sites where work has not started and there seems to be little prospect of it happening in the foreseeable future. The most high profile one is of course the Barbican site where there have been two separate, lots, separate permissions granted for apartments but not one new dwelling has been delivered. So the council is doing its job and grant, granting permissions but has no power to enforce building to start. And why? Well, profit, of course. Developers are not in the habit of subsidising houses unless forced to, and will therefore land bank sites with permission until the economic conditions are right for them. And, of course, the more sites that are allocated and given permission, the less the developer will make, so the longer they will sit on the site. It's clearly in the developer's interest for there to be a shortage of housing sites, not to glut. So will this white paper help the situation in York? not unless there is some way of requiring developers to build the houses that they have permission for. So we need to ensure that the council, councils do retain the necessary powers by implementing the reforms outlined in the motion. It is the, to the Labour Party's shame that in the 13 years they were in power, they did little to reverse the Tory legislation around the use of right-to-buy income. The changes they did make still don't allow councils to reinvest 100% of that income in social housing, thus presented preventing thousands of new homes being provided. Resident, residents hold the right to object to planning applications very dear, and the white paper will remove that right. There needs to be the opportunity... You can come towards a close, please. Yeah, thank you. There needs to be that opportunity for residents to be engaged in the planning process at all stages, and the opportunity for local councillors to exercise their democratic role. I urge members to support this motion and allow York residents the opportunity to continue to shape York's future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your comments uh, have been noted and will be taken into account uh, when that motion is debated. Uh, third speaker, Lars Cram, who would like to speak on item eight, one on the agenda, the motion on improving democracy and services. Lars. Thank you a lot, Mayor. While I fully support Councillor Doughty's motion to restore transparency and accountability at the Council in a COVID-secure way, I believe that just restoring an insufficient system is not enough and councillors should use this opportunity and embrace the Build Back Better approach for local democracy. If York's independence will survive next week, this will be the time to do things differently. Last local election left no party with an overall majority on the council, a situation that is not something new, 
And since becoming a unitary authority in 95, we saw, in fact, more no overall control than one single party in control. Moreover, in the last 10 years, the council saw no less than six council leaders, two Labour, three Conservatives, and one Lib Dem, and the current leader just survived a vote of no confidence. Furthermore, every administration has been rejected by voters at the ballot box. The strong leader executive model that York is practicing should create stability, but does create polarization between the parties, infighting in the parties, and distractions about the personal behavior and benefits of individuals in the spotlight. The alternative is a change to the committee system. In principle, the committee system has long been supported by Lib Dems and Greens, and both 2019 manifestos covered this change. Traditionally, it has not been supported by Labour or the Conservatives, but there are indications that others might support this fundamental change in governance. Under the committee system, a local authority can decide how its functions and powers are delivered. It is possible for full council to make all its decisions or it can delegate certain responsibilities to an unlimited number of committees, subcommittees, or offices. A new drive not far from home for the committee system just came recently in Sheffield. In one of Yorkshire's biggest town halls, decisions will be taken by committees after residents voted overwhelmingly in a referendum for this change. Democracy is not just about winning elections every couple of years and shouting over each other in the meantime but also about working together for society as a whole and the common good. Should we not at least utilize the skills, experience, and views of all the different people who got elected under our broken voting system and give them a seat at the table to decide and scrutinize proposals and advice by officers to improve and develop York for its current and future residents? Why waste this civic resource on reading out scripted statements at full council meetings every blue moon. A change is urgently needed. A committee system can be part of the solution. Let's do politics differently and reflect in our governance the inclusivity and cooperation that York's residents are famous for. Thank Thank you you a lot, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. It will be noted. It is noted and will be taken into account when the motion is debated. Our fourth speaker, Andrew Mortimer, who is here in person, who would like to speak on item 8.3 on the agenda, the motion on fixing social care. Mr Mortimer. Lord Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to address Council this evening. Uh, I want to speak tonight in support of the motion from Councillor Runciman about fixing social care. I think like most of us present tonight, I remember one of the first things that Boris Johnson promised to do when he became prime minister was, and I quote, to fix the crisis in social care once and for all with a clear plan we have prepared. Well, two years later, nothing has happened. There's been no fix, no plan, not even a hint of any change. Maybe this isn't surprising given the coronavirus pandemic that we've all been struggling with. But given the lack of any details, I actually wonder if this government has a plan. And maybe that's not such a bad thing. What we definitely don't need is a one-party plan. I do agree with the Prime Minister that this is a crisis. What we now need from him is leadership to bring together the country to find a way ahead. It's time for the government to act, and the Council can make this clear by passing the notice of motion. I'm a carer for my adult stepson. I understand the challenges with social care for people of all ages. For those involved as a profession or a vocation, or just out of love for those we care for, it can be difficult to manage at times. From worrying about having to sell the family home down to whether or not the most basic of services is going to be available can be very difficult to deal with. We need a clear plan to deal with this broad range of issues that together met this a real crisis. And therefore, I urge you to support the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Mortimer. Your comments have been noted. They will be taken into account when that motion is debated. Our fifth speaker, uh, Jane Burton, uh, who would like to speak on agenda item 8.4, the motion on access for all on behalf of York Disability Rights 
forum. Thank you, Lord Mayor. York is a human rights city and every local authority has duties under the Equality Act. The Council's effective exclusion of many disabled people from their own city centre violates both. It violates the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities by failing to ensure our human rights and fundamental freedoms are respected alongside non-disabled people. Incidentally, this includes our right to take part in cultural life, something that this council said it would ensure it included in their recently launched cultural strategy. The council's own survey in September 2020 found that more than three quarters of blue badge holders disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement there is parking close enough to allow me access to the city centre. And yet the council continues to claim that disabled people welcome the removal of central blue badge parking. Disabled people are not an homogenous group, so access requires a range of measures to be in place. But this must include blue badge spaces close enough to the places they need to go. Alternative access routes, crucial though they are, will not be sufficient to meet the needs of all disabled people. Saying that some people have felt safer as a result of the changes does not erase the impact on those now excluded. Safety and access are two different issues. Both need attention. Disabled people in the city have been working together on this, despite what feels like repeated attempts by the council to set one group against another. It's time that the council stop trying to divide us. And of 26 respondents with sensory impairments, only two agree strongly or strongly agree with the statement there is parking close enough to allow me access to the city centre. Further, the biased nature of the survey means that the respondents were led in their answers. York Disability Rights Forum was formed over a year ago to develop a pan-disability voice and space in the city. We have been inundated with people contacting us about city centre access with heartbreaking stories from those no longer able to reach central post office, their only bank branch, or even to visit places they love, such as City Screen. We wish you would start to hear, really hear, those stories and the impact of your measures. Despite the healthier, greener York motion stating that the executive member for transport would work closely with disability advocacy groups, We did not hear directly from him until the 28th of June, 2021, and then only in response to an email that we sent to him. All he did was direct us to contribute to the surveys currently open. Access is not an issue of preference or convenience, but of law and decency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. Um, uh, That is just a little more than three minutes, but your comments have been noted and certainly will be taken into account when the motion is debated. Uh, Our sixth speaker, Ian Mitchell, uh, who would also like to speak, thank you, on motion uh, four in relation to access for visually impaired people. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. I'm speaking on behalf of the York Sight Loss Council, who are a self-advocating group of blind and partially sighted residents with lived experience who face accessibility challenges and issues on a daily basis. Accessibility is more than expanding the foot streets or placing an embargo on blue badge holders. Accessibility, or should I say inaccessibility, is a shared challenge for all disabled groups, even if we experience them in different ways. I'd like to familiarize you with the social model of disability. The model says that people are disabled by barriers in society, not by their impairment or difference. Barriers can be caused by people's attitude to difference. They assume they know what is needed or how barriers can be eliminated without including those groups affected before making that decision. Removing these barriers creates equality and offers disabled people more independence, choice and control. We are able to access the goods, services and opportunities that those classed as able-bodied can participate and enjoy and benefit from as a norm. Under the public sector equality duty, the council has to comply with three criteria. It should eliminate unlawful discrimination. And after hearing Councillor Lomas's plea and how that was rejected, I question that. 
It should advance equality of opportunity between people who share a protected characteristic than those who don't. It should foster or encourage good relations between people who share a protected characteristic and those who don't. Having due regard means public authorities must consciously consider the need to do the three things set out in the public sector equality duty. I'm going to revert back to the social model of disability. Thus, placing an embargo on blue badge holders parking close to familiar locations advance an equality of opportunity, or does it serve to create a new barrier that didn't exist? Councillor Melly's motion embodies those principles, putting the needs of disabled residents first. It stated that every local authority has a duty under the Equality Act to enable people to get close as reasonably possible to where they need to get to. The amendment to Councillor Melly's motion waters that down, not to protect disabled people, but to protect the council's decision. It states that every local authority has a duty under the Equality Act to consider the impact of any changes they make and makes reasonable adjustments to ensure that the impacts on those with protected characteristics are minimalised. No reasonable adjustment would be needed if the barrier wasn't created in the first instance. Remember that social model of disability. Barriers can be caused by people's attitudes. I hope that the council will reflect on their decision Please. and ask if the small gain to place the embargo on blue badge holders worth the hurt, anguish and distress that their decision causes to the most vulnerable residents of York. COVID life is hard Thank enough you. for disabled people without placing further restrictions on us at a Thank time you. when other people are having restrictions. Sometimes a moral Thank you very much. Thank you. You're, I'm, I'm really sorry to draw a line there, but um, to be fair to all speakers, uh, three minutes is, is the allotted time. Your comments have been noted and will be taken into account when the motion is debated. Our seventh speaker, uh, Kataya Makiva Willis, who will also speak on motion four about improvements to accessibility. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so I just want to start by saying that I'm horrified at the discriminatory exclusion um, of Councillor Lomas from this debate. Um, I think it highlights the attitude of the Council towards people with disabilities in the city. Um, so I want to speak in favour of Councillor Melly's motion because the city centre needs to get made more accessible to everybody and that the Council do need to come up with more innovative solutions to increase access to the city centre and essential parts of retail and also things that improve their social life like city screen. Now although 61% of disabled people in the latest survey either agreed or strongly agreed on extending the foot streets, blue badge holders have had their access impaired to the city centre and this shows that greater consultation and more innovative ways of thinking needs to be considered and it shouldn't be just a case of one size fits all. All avenues need to be explored in making the city centre as fully accessible as possible. Although alternative measures such as shuttles from the station, different bike racks and so forth will help, there needs to be consultation with all groups involved, including blue badge holders. Despite the healthier greener York motion being passed in December 2019 to encourage less car use in the city centre and stating that it will work with disability groups to ensure that access to the city centre is maintained, other actions by the council indicate that this is very much a lower priority. The example that springs to my mind is the stopping up order on Lehman Road, which moves the nearest bus stop to more than 400 metres away for some residents, which is substantially beyond the 200 metres meters best practice, um, which is stated by the government and the, C um, the City of York Council guidance. It actively makes the city centre less accessible for many disabled people and encourages those who could and discourages those who otherwise would be able to use public transport and forces them to use cars, which because of the restrictions on blue badge holders, they now can't have access to city centre that way either. This increases the average walking time um, from 1.5 minutes to six minutes. For, and for the less mobile, this can increase from two minutes to 9.5 minutes. And it's worth um, pointing out that not all the less mobile can walk that far. So access to the city centre um, needs um, with a disability um, and the disability can be anything so physical, mental or any other impairment. It needs to be better for everybody. And York's status as a medieval city um, 
with things like Yorkstone does mean that it's got its own set of challenges, but that doesn't mean that the city should become inaccessible to those with a disability, especially when it's due to aesthetics. Thank you very much. Councillor Eyre. Just to the point of Lord, uh, Lord, Lord Mayor, because a number of speakers have raised that Councillor Lomas has been to advise that she has to leave the meeting, and I fully agree with everything she has to say, but for the record, that applies to two of the councillors in this room, not just one, and it's, it's not one that's been signalled out. Councillor Mason has received the same advice and taken the same action. I think it needs to be reflected that that is not an issue for one council, it's an issue for two, and I, I fully sympathise with the views that were, that were made. Thank you for that, that point. I'm, I'm not sure I want to get into debate at, at, at this it's particular juncture. We've only yeah. got a limited amount of time for public uh, speakers and I need to press on. And just, just the sound quality, I'm really struggling to hear what people are saying clearly. Is there anything we can do to improve it? You're, you're not the only one, I'm sure. I, I'm sure if there was anything more that could be done, Sorry. it would. No. Okay, uh, unfortunately, there's nothing that we can be done. We're, we're working on it as much as that's, that's possible in the circumstances. But I think we're all struggling to hear it quite as well as we'd, we'd like to. Nevertheless, I, th I think we're getting the uh, we're getting the message uh, with speaker uh, with each speaker as we hear them. Our eighth speaker is Diane Roweth, again speaking on motion four, uh, access by blind and partially sighted people, and the council's equality duty. Councillor Mellor's motion has much to commend but I ask that it is strengthened by ensuring that blue badge holders retain their right to enter the city centre. There is little point in having great facilities if severely disabled people cannot get there in the first place. I and a great many people were, to use the Yorkshire expression, gobsmacked that the council should propose a policy that excluded blue badge use in the city centre. And I'm amazed that two councillors have been refused permission to enter this debate. Research shows that disabled people are more adversely affected by COVID than non-disabled people. The blue badge exclusion policy is a real example of that. Prior to the granting of emergency powers, we could drive or take a taxi into the city. We are now coming out of the pandemic, so why cannot we resume having blue badge access? On what evidence is the council basing its decision? If it's safety, how many accidents were caused by blue badge holders or taxis? Would a reduced speed limit not be more appropriate? Did the council pay enough attention to its public equality duty? If it had, this policy may not even have hit the table. The council's own equality strategy, a fairer city, echoes the three strands of the equality duty, and I summarise. Our aim will be to make York an equal, inclusive and welcoming city where people have access to the things they need to thrive as individuals, tackling inequality and barriers. Your actions are giving a completely opposite message to disabled people, their friends and families. We feel not wanted in the city, kept out of sight and a pawn to be sacrificed in your quest to create a car-free city centre. You've already heard about the three equality duties. Banning blue badge use does not meet any of these. It jeopardises equality of opportunity and creates dependency. In future, people may have to organise a carer or support worker to help them get where they want to be. If that's not possible, or if you can't use your badge in a taxi, like blind people often do, you cannot go into the centre. This reduces equality of opportunity by excluding people from city life. You may remember Councillor Lynn Jeffries. She was a disabled woman who stood up for disabled people's rights. This policy would have excluded her from attending meetings at the Guildhall because she could not get there by car. This policy now means that anyone organising an event anywhere in the city centre cannot offer fair access for disabled people. So we become excluded. We become invisible because we give up trying to come in or we are viewed as unable to lead independent lives because we've always got a carer with us. Thank you. How can we foster good relations between disabled people and non-disabled people if we are never in the same space? Please stop your the constant erosion of disabled people's rights and opportunities and consider the cumulative effect of all of your actions. 
you extra Thank you. I'm sorry to cut across you, but I have to draw a line there. It's just a little more than three minutes and your contribution has been heard and will be noted, taken into account when the motion is debated. Thank you. And ninth and final speaker, Alison Hume, who would like to ask a question of Councillor de Gorn about disabled parking bays. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I'd like to say that I consider it outright discrimination that disabled councillors have been barred from speaking tonight. I am speaking on behalf of York Accessibility Action as an ally of the disabled community and carer of a young adult with complex disabilities. Chester, Canterbury and Bath all welcome blue badge holders into their ancient city centres. For a human rights city, York is fast becoming a national embarrassment. The latest street closures were introduced alongside mitigating measures which required disabled people to park their cars on the outskirts, transfer into a taxi they didn't want to use and be dropped off somewhere they didn't want to go. The arrogance showed by this failed mitigation would have been laughable but for the waste of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money and the distress caused to disabled drivers, their families and carers. It seems nothing has been learned from that debacle. The council continues to make the same mistake, making patronising and ableist decisions on behalf of disabled people and then asking for comments. I wish to ask Councillor de Gorn the following. Why have you yet again proposed mitigation which is not suitable for all disabled people and yet again before the limited consultation process is concluded? The new measures consist of a mere handful of parking bays on the outskirts of the city. They are much too further out from, from the centre and too far away. People have to travel further by whatever means remains at their disposal. If that's a manual wheelchair, crutches or stick, probably twice or three times further. Also, why have you ignored the fact that for many disabled people, a car is not just a mobility aid? It's an aid to living with a disability. For many blue badge holders, their families and carers, their vehicle is a sanctuary, a place to rest, to feed, often through a peg for a disabled child, a place to ride the storm of exhaustion, a panic attack, a place to return to between trips, a safe place. Because you consider, continue to select mitigations to suit yourselves as a council and your own agenda, the full reasons about why blue badges are granted and how they are used have been conveniently overlooked. By seeking to ignore the very reasons people with a protected characteristic are given services and benefits, you are failing in your public duty and engaging in large-scale discrimination. Councillor de Gorn, Will you accept that the replacement disabled parking spaces are simply too far away to allow proper and equitable access to the city centre? Thank Please. you. Oh, thank you for your, uh, your, your question. Uh, your comments have been noted. You'll provided, you will be provided with a written answer to your question within 10 working days. That concludes the public participation session. Item five, petitions. Uh, notice has not been received of any petitions to be presented this evening, so I will meet, move straight to the next item. Being item six, report of the executive leader and the executive recommendations. And I invite the uh, leader, Councillor Aspen, to present his written report, which you'll find on page 43 of our council papers. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Firstly, I'd like to say that it's a real pleasure to see everyone again, councillors, officers and guests, and hold our first in-person full council meeting for a long time, and albeit with a few changes. I wanted to start this evening by welcoming you, Lord Mayor, um, to your first meeting as chair of full council. You may regret that you do not have the luxury of a mute button this evening. As colleagues will know, this week saw the confirmation that the government will proceed with step four of the roadmap out of lockdown this Monday coming. And whilst this is a positive step, we must recognise that the pandemic is not yet over. With the number of positive cases continuing to increase in the city, 
there will be many people who are anxious about the relaxation of national restrictions. There is no doubt that this will bring many changes for us all, so the Council will be working with partners to encourage everyone to continue to respect others whilst enjoying the city. I think it's important to emphasise that many people are still yet to get the protection two doses of the vaccine can offer, and that is why we'll be urging everyone to get tested regularly and to help reduce the spread of the virus. In the meantime, the Council will continue to do what it can to support communities through this period of change, and as detailed in my report, the Council's helpline is still there for people who need support or advice. As part of this, we'll be working closely with businesses and partners to help the city recover safely, particularly as work develops on the 10-year city plan. Moving on from the pandemic, since my last report to Council, our submission to the consultation on local government reorganisation has been submitted, in which we strongly advocated for York to remain as a unitary authority on its existing footprint. I was also pleased that the cross-party petition on Back York was presented to the House of Commons, and again, I'd like to thank all colleagues for their support. We are expecting formal confirmation from the government before Parliament goes on recess, meaning we expect to hear the outcome by the end of next week. Given the government's record of communicating on this issue, we do not expect prior warning, but please be assured that we'll communicate with you all as soon as possible. On the local plan, officers are currently working through the consultation responses with the aim of getting everything back to the inspectors by the end of August in order to then proceed to examination hearings in October. Progress continues to be maintained on the York Central site, with the first phase of site clearance works now beginning to draw to a close. As detailed in the report, we are lobbying with partners to secure a government hub and further civil servants in the city. And more recently, we have asked the Secretary of State for Transport to locate the headquarters of the newly established Great British Railways at York Central. I hope colleagues will agree with me, there could be no more fitting city than York for GBR. I welcome the incredibly positive work that has taken place to sign us up to the Good Business Charter and for York to become the first Good Business Charter city. The charter includes many of the positive socio-economic outcomes I'm sure many of us would like to see. And for that reason, we'll be working with partners to promote the work and to ensure that its values are at the center of our efforts to build back better. Moving on to the SEND inclusion review, I would like to thank those residents who have taken their time to share their views on the provision in the city. This of course is a hugely important service area for the council and it's quite right that we work to identify how we can best improve our support for young people with their communication and interaction needs as well as their emotional and mental health. Lord Mayor, you'll be pleased to know that I'm almost finished. However, before I move on to final remarks, I'd like to take the opportunity to condemn some of the awful racist abuse that some members of the England squad received during the Euro 2020 final. I know that everyone will join me here in condemning this behaviour and instead give our thanks as a council to all members of the England team following a difficult year and a half for us all. Lastly, Lord Mayor, I'd like to welcome councillors Kilbane and Douglas to their new roles as leader and deputy leader of the Labour Group uh, and similarly thank Councillor Myers and Perrett for their commitment and work over the last two years. I know that we will disagree on many issues, but I do look forward to working together constructively where we can. As always, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Aspen. Thank you for staying within the uh, allotted five minutes. Um, other group leaders have the opportunity of uh, responding again with up to five minutes. Councillor Kilbane. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, the warm welcome, Councillor Aspen, and indeed uh, uh, a warm welcome to you, Lord Mayor. Uh, you suit the role very well, and I th we will look forward to working with you in the smooth running of future Council meetings. It would be remiss not to acknowledge and congratulate the England football team on their efforts at the Euros, and we look forward to bringing home the World Cup next year. I will avoid clumsy football and politics metaphors. They tend to result in an own goal. Uh, we do also unequivocally condemn the vile racism, racism that the tournament unmasked, and we stand or indeed take the knee uh, with those in solidarity with those who suffer it every day. I welcome the leader's comments on COVID. I personally was unlucky enough to catch it, and it's not something I would want to pass on even to my worst political opponents. It seems the Prime Minister's got bored with managing the pandemic and is now being led by dates, not data. Uh, and it's time for all of us on the Council to come together and send the right signal to residents about what's needed at this critical time. 
So we were happy to initiate and sign the cross-party statement urging everyone to remain vigilant against the virus. Yes, we need to be able to start living again, but with our healthcare system close to cracking, uh, and as we will hear, social care in constant crisis, we can't afford to let our guard down at this late stage. I agree with the leader. There is significant support in the city for retaining local decision making uh, in spite of the low level of interest in the petition. Uh, perhaps you could learn lessons from the recycling consultation. If you wind up our residents enough, they'll tell you what they think, whether you like it or not. Uh, but I don't think it was a good idea to follow that up with weeks and weeks of uncollected bins. Uh, it would be a surprise if the government entered York's unitary status. Um, but we are the only council in the country that have two public interest reports against it over serious governance failures. A council that the government trusts so little it switched £77 million of funding for York Central to the landowners instead of the local authority. A council that so frustrated the local plan examiners that they nearly walked away. And of course, an administration that drives top officers out of their jobs at significant taxpayer expense, using every possible means to cover the tracks. What possible reason could the government have for bringing the City of York Council's relatively short existence to an end? Let's also hope that the local plan is limping towards the finish line as the city's residents need certainty over how York will develop in the years to come. We also need developers and landowners building the new homes this city needs in volumes so that a high level of affordable homes come with it. And we need a council committed to increasing its stock of socially rented homes, not one that just stands back and manages the decline. Indeed, it was shocking to hear Councillor Eyre tell the executive that we are not in the business of house building in my first attendance as group leader. But this most recent tinkering with the plan has highlighted some of its most fundamental flaws. The scaling back of developments like the one near El Elvington has shown that this administration doesn't want sustainable garden village type communities. Instead, you plan to build at a scale that will not support the level of services residents living in them need. The Lib Dem local plan is committed to building thousands of homes in the draft green belt. If you had any vision, you would adapt those plans in the right places using low grade agricultural land to support the necessary infrastructure required to make these developments self supporting 15 minute neighborhoods. Instead, lacking vision, you report to you resort to political expediency in the hope it will save your York outer councillors. And so recent community complaints, such as those around Fulford school access, are a sign of things to come as more and more demand is placed on already stretched services in the existing parts of the city. I share the leader's disappointment that York doesn't feature in the priority lists of areas eligible for community renewal funding. Uh, I think it was the Public Accounts Committee that said of the previous town's fund allocations that they were politically motivated and not impartial. It can be really galling when there is an obvious need for funding, desperately obvious in some of the poorest communities, and you find most of the money has been funneled into areas where such need does not exist. Some might say it's just swings and roundabouts. I say it's simply immoral. However, we do wish York's community renewal funding bids every success, even though it's hard to see exactly how they address the crippling economic inequality in our city. Finally, Lord Mayor, credit where it's due. We applaud the leader on your initiative to invite Great British Railways to York Central and look forward to hearing how you will pursue this objective in which we wish you every success. We also welcome the Good Business Charter it's a common sense manifesto initially proposed by Labour that we are pleased to see adopted by the Council. We hope this is followed up by a concerted effort to promote what the Charter can deliver to the workers and small and medium sized businesses who potentially stand to benefit. To borrow the Tory government and the Council leaders oft cited slogan, it's success or otherwise will be a measure of how committed you really are to build back better. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kilbane. Can I, at this point, just ask if there are other group leaders who wish to? Yes, I see Councillor Doughty. Councillor Doughty. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and congratulations on your appointment. As ever, the Council leader wins few prizes for detail or vision as he presents his usual selective narrative of recent weeks. I agree with the first two pages in thanking those who continue to work hard across the city in such trying circumstances 
and would urge any people that have yet to have both COVID vaccines to get them done. The UK government has led the world in vaccinations and this is to be greatly welcomed. As we come out of lockdown, hopefully for the final time, we must all go forward sensibly and thinking of the more vulnerable. We are, of course, soon to find out what, if anything, will happen with York in the local government reorganisation. I fail to see how anyone with a straight face who is not motivated purely by narrow, especially Lib Dem political interest, can say City of York has shown itself a well-run council. The council's propaganda campaign has been nothing short of embarrassing, and yet still only 3,200 supported the absurdly named Back York campaign, less than a fifth, incidentally, of the number that supported the retention of Union Terrace car park exactly 10 years ago. Although it is welcome that this is one of Council Aspen's reports when he doesn't totally ignore the local plan, it does seem he continues to not have read the planning inspector's issues with how York defined its green belts. The inspectors took principled issues with the way the council had defined green belts, not exactly how specific lines were drawn. Essentially, they asked whether the council admitted its method was wrong, could prove the inspectors were wrong, or the council could evidence it was wrong, but it made no difference to the boundaries. The council has done none of these. Surely two years out from the election, the Lib Dems are not already trying to delay and fudge the plan, so it goes nowhere except sits in the file marked too difficult. We would, of course, welcome British, Great British Railways to the York Central site. However, there are only a few, very few organisations or companies that the council leader has not said he would welcome to the site. I think the Conservative Party is the only organisation to have mentioned a relocation and use the word north without Council Aspen urging it to move to York Central. Would Great British Railways be a great tenant at York Central? Yes, it would. However, it's extremely concerning that the council continues to push full steam ahead at a cost of millions to the taxpayer with huge office building on the south site without the faintest idea who will occupy them. It is. The Conservative group reiterates its urging for York Central office plans to be reality checked against the world today, especially post pandemic. Castle Gateway seems to plod along with consultants' advice bills moving on at a rather more rapid pace. The words about all the listening to residents don't seem to quite resonate with the concerns I've heard about the project and which planning committees have seen frequently play out. I note the Goods Business Charter, forward to hearing the tangibles of success by which it should be judged. Apart from the real living wage, the nine other supposed commitments are all entirely subjective. It has the look of a project, project that will take time and cost the city money without any real improvement. Of course, the very businesses that will sign up to such a policy will invariably be the ones that are behaving well anyway. It's the minority of exploitative businesses that should be focused on. Councillor Aston expresses in respect of the Community Renewal Fund that York is not deemed one of the priority places. I assume he's not bothered to read the criteria or perish the thought perhaps he's merely trying to play politics. The government is committed to levelling up, especially the North-South divide, something the Lib Dems offered precisely nothing on in their brief foray into government. In terms of the large money being put into York, I suggest he refers to his own report or that of his executive colleague, Councillor Widdison. Finally, I join in welcoming our Armed Forces Day and saluting all the good that the armed forces do for us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doughty. Councillor Carr. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thanks for the opportunity of speaking and congratulations on your appointment. I'll be extremely brief and just say that like the leader, I hope that this face-to-face -face full council meeting, the first for 15 months, is the first faltering step on what will turn out to be a relatively short road back to normalizing our democracy. Thank you. Thank you for those contributions. Um, Councillor Aspen, you have the opportunity to respond if you choose to do so. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. And if I could thank, thank Councillors Kilbane, Doughty and, and Carr uh, for their comments, uh, particularly Councillor Kilbane's uh, welcome of the, the comments and work from the Council on COVID uh, against uh, racism and also our agreement about the community 
renewal uh, funding. Um, I equally agree with him uh, about the need for the, the shared statement from group leaders um, to send that shared message out to the city as, as relaxation of restrictions uh, happen. Um, I think we'll debate later health and social care, but I think that is one of the areas where our groups nationally and, and locally indeed will have a lot of uh, common ground and we should work together on those uh, areas. And um, we're not the only area, of course, waiting to hear about local government reorganisation. Uh, colleagues in Cumbria and Somerset are in the same uh, situation. It will be very, very interesting, particularly following the Prime Minister's speech today about levelling up and the change of direction. Uh, in the government policy on devolution, uh, what that means, uh, not just for us, but across the country. And obviously we'll be looking at those levelling up proposals and making sure that we all, I'm sure, work together to get the best deal uh, from York when they fully publish that policy prospectus. Uh, I'm really proud of the progress on York Central. Um, actually, it will create jobs, it will create new public spaces, it will create uh, new possibilities in the city, uh, not just for the, the coming years, but for the coming uh, decades. And the work that the council partners and officers have done uh, over decades is what has enabled that funding uh, package and all of the public sector partners uh, to make it, it happen. Uh, and that's certainly what I'm going to focus on and actually creating those jobs, new spaces, new homes, in the city and um, similarly i'm proud of our work on the housing uh, delivery program and um, yes the local plan will deliver a lot of homes and a lot of affordable homes in the city but it is absolutely right that as a council we set out a new standard uh, and our housing delivery plan which has for example been described as probably the most ambitious in the country by the guardian other other papers exist is one that we should all be proud of in terms of environmental sustainability and community features that it is setting out uh, as a real beacon for what other councils can do. I think what Councillor Eyre was saying is that our housing delivery plan alone cannot deliver all of the houses uh, that we need and um, we need that local plan and frankly we need an awful lot more support from the government on social rented uh, homes and really being able to allow local authorities to accelerate uh, that work. Uh, to Councillor Doughty, we agree on the thanks to businesses, volunteers, key workers and on Armed Forces uh, Day. I mentioned the, the local plan. Um, you're right, we have consulted on those modifications in response to the inspector. Um, that work is now completed and will be sent back to the inspectors, as I said, in August. And what is then really important for us is that we get onto those hearings uh, and get that plan in place. Um, because none of us want to see uh, the government intervening uh, and then uh, letting loose a developer's charter, uh, as we've seen uh, other residents in the south of England express their frustration with some of the government's proposals in that, that area uh, recently. Um, it is my job as council leader uh, to attract jobs and to work and lobby the government and other partners. I'm certainly not going to turn down jobs or opportunities in York Central. Um, and actually, the new cabinet office jobs that have been announced are welcome. Maintaining the DEFRA and MOD jobs in the city is very important, but we are now working with the government to attract government hub, uh, still looking at the prospect of a conference centre on that site. And indeed, it was Councillor Dowsey's own government that commissioned uh, a business case and is looking through that to see the possibilities of that government hub and conference centre. So I'm sure he actually welcomes my work here and indeed the work cross party to, to secure that. Uh, and finally, Lord Mayor, completely agree with Councillor Carr. I hope this is the return of many uh, meetings in person again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Aspen. Standing orders allows 10 minutes for members to ask further questions. I uh, already see two hands. I will go first to Councillor Pavlovic and then to Councillor Waters. <clears throat> okay. There Thank are a number you, of others. Councillor Pavlovic first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Aspden, should government decide that York should lose the independence to run its own affairs as part of the reorganisation of local government, thereby severing 800 years of proud history between the people of York and those they choose to run it? Would he agree that it would be as a result of government lack of confidence in this administration. A few examples of, were given by Councillor Kilbane. And Councillor Aspden, 
If that is the decision of government, how will you judge the part you have personally played, both in terms of your leadership and your behavior? Because if you don't have that level of self-awareness, I fear history and the people of York will not judge your tenure positively. Thank you, Councillor Pavlovich, for your uh, question. Um, the quick answer is no, um, I, I do not agree. Um, the, the longer answer is that I very much agree with your comments about the importance of maintaining York, uh, making decisions for York in York. Uh, and obviously that reflects the significant amount of work that the council, councillors uh, and across parties uh, and with external uh, supporters put into uh, not just setting out that case, but repeatedly setting out that case, submitting government, and obviously working with colleagues uh, across uh, North Yorkshire to make that case as strongly as possible. And I welcome the support from different parties and different councillors uh, along that journey. Uh, many of us uh, regret that that is a situation that we were in in the first place, uh, because obviously that was the particular government uh, policy at the time. And as I've said, we already have heard today that there is potentially a slight change with their aspirations on devolution. So we'll wait to see what the uh, implications of that are. Uh, but I very much uh, hope uh, that York will uh, remain if it did not. Um, I think that would be extremely uh, disappointing for us. It would be a backward step for the residents of York. And I'm sure that officers and the council uh, would want to come together and work together uh, very quickly if that was the case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Waters and then Councillor Fenton, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. I know with interest the, the leader's comments regarding the local plan and the, well, using his words, careful consideration of the Greenbelt boundaries, presumably by council staff. So I'd like to take the opportunity to ask the leader if he'd like to apologise to Dunnington residents for the confusion caused by the circulation of a recent Lib Dem leaflet with the wrong Greenbelt boundaries for the village shown. After a hasty reprint, Dunnington residents were then asked to support the Lib Dems proposed Greenbelt boundaries as submitted, which exclude a chunk of Greenbelt for a very unpopular and strongly contested housing development. If you as Lib Dem leaders of this city haven't a clue what you are talking about in relation to these matters, what confidence can anyone have in the local plan process getting past the independent inspectors? Can we have an apology for Dunnington Parish Council and the residents, please? And having just heard the leader's response to other group leaders regarding the local plan, I noted with interest that he said the recent submissions would be sent off to the inspectors by the end of August. Now, assuming that those inspectors will take a month to six weeks to peruse those uh, responses and then when they get back to the council um, they the, the council's response to setting up um, the uh, inspection in public will have to give six weeks notice for any respondents will the council have the council waters I, i'm going to draw a line there I will think the council asked, have the capacity to deal with the local plan already. when the interim director is set to leave at the end of october would the council leader care to respond thank council you Aspen, please uh, thank you uh, very much uh, lord mayor and um, Starting with the, the, the final question, I think I was pretty clear that it was important and our aim to get the uh, consultation results on the modifications uh, back to the inspectors in August. Uh, and that therefore is with the aim of having those hearings in October. Uh, and that was the timeline that we've agreed with the uh, planning inspectorate. And as I said to Councillor Doughty, it's incredibly important for us all uh, to meet that timeline and then to maintain uh, that progress uh, on the local plan. Um, with uh, Councillor Waters' first comment, I understand uh, that there was, as he says, a printing error on a small number of leaflets and that those affected received a letter apologising uh, for that error, which I'm quite happy to repeat for those residents that, that received that in Dunnington. Thank you. Councillor Fenton and then Councillor Fisher, if time permits. <clears throat> uh, 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. Just returning to the issue of the um, local government reorganisation, and I, I welcome the uh, indications that we could expect a, a decision sometime, sometime soon. Um, I just wondered if Councillor Aspton could set out what, what he would expect the next steps to be uh, once we receive that we receive that decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fenton. Um, the uh, MHCLG confirmed today, um, as the, the Prime Minister was giving his levelling up speech, that those three areas mentioned, Cumbria, Somerset and, and York and North Yorkshire, uh, would receive uh, an answer on their recommendation uh, before uh, Parliament goes into recess. Uh, leaders will receive a letter from the Secretary of State, uh, Chief Executives, will receive a note from the lead uh, civil servant in the email at the, the, the same time. Um, clearly, if it's a York and North Yorkshire decision, which the, the vast majority of the council wants, um, work then starts with uh, civil servants to discuss uh, what might that then get us in terms of devolution? What does it mean for York and North Yorkshire? What offer is on the table? Uh, the announcements today seem to indicate that it isn't just mayoral combined authorities that potentially are on offer, but they are talking about county deals and that actually two councils could pitch for a county deal. We don't know any of the detail yet, and there'll be an awful lot for the council offers as partners to work through uh, to get the most ambitious deal and obviously to get as much achieved for York. Um, if East uh, West was the preferred model, um, we would have to get a, a lot of advice from civil servants and from officers, have a briefing for all councillors, uh, and then my aspiration would be to bring that back to look at next steps to another meeting of uh, full council to look at that together. If that is the case, it slows down significantly any talk of county deals or devolution potentially by a year or two years, whilst you're then looking at shadow authorities, interim management arrangements, uh, and what that means. So let's hope that does not happen. Uh, but if it does, I know that we'll, we'll work together through the consequences. Thank you. Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I was actually trying to indicate that Councillor Pearson was the first person to put his hand up and he's obviously in total eclipse. It was Councillor Pearson who wanted to speak. I was just indicating to you that he did. <laughs> You'll appreciate that my sight line across to that side is, is not that helpful. Uh, uh, please do. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was pleased to read, obviously, in the leader's report about the lobbying efforts to secure uh, the headquarters of uh, Great British Rail here in York. Um, have we heard anything back about that? Thank you, Councillor Pearson, and, and welcome your support on that campaign. Um, yes, we, we have. We received a very quick response from the Rail Minister, Chris Heaton Harris, who, who welcomed our initial letter. Um, and subsequent to that, we have now sent um, a letter with a slide pack uh, of information that was compiled by the York and North Yorkshire Let um, to the Secretary of State and the Rail Minister, uh, confirming some of the, the, the strengths of York and why they should consider uh, York for that. Um, I've also subsequently had a call with the Rail Minister uh, and also with Sir Peter Hendy, Chair of Network Rail, um, to further make the case uh, for York, and they have both uh, responded positively, uh, obviously, that it is one of a number of places that they might consider, but I very much hope that we will work together at something that I do believe is, is achievable. Thank you. We've just a, a minute left. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, on the topic of SEND review, uh, the leader states that the council needs to take stock of what is working well, how we might want to deliver provision differently, or what we need to improve. Given that the driver for this review is about money, or the lack thereof, can the leader expand on what he means by delivering provision differently? Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. The, the, the review, as you say, is, is about consulting um, with children, parents and families to make sure that the terminology that is used is sufficiency, to, to make sure that you're delivering uh, the right and appropriate uh, services uh, for those that need them. And um, now that detailed consultation, which I know a lot of families took part in and would like to thank them, has been completed. Officers are now looking at the consultation results 
and they'll bring a detailed paper back through to the executive to both update us on the consultation results, uh, provision at the moment, um, and what that might look like moving forward, where we can make improvements, where we can respond uh, to, to parents' needs and requests. And I'm sure that's something I and or officers or Councillor Cuthbertson would be very happy to talk to Councillor Webber about in advance. Thank you. Supplementary, Lord Mayor. Do we have time or? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is the kind of euphemism we've become used to hearing to describe cuts to services in recent years. In 2016, when Lib Dem cut around 40% of the budget and almost half of the staff from children's early intervention and preventative services, it was described as a new offer. Indeed it was. While the public may have some sympathy with the financial constraints the council faces, it will be less sympathetic to the spin. Will the leader therefore be honest with the public, many of whom who have genuine anxieties about changes that may affect their own children in what is expected to follow this consultation, especially given recent speculation about significant staffing cuts to the council's SEND team? Is this what the council leader means by doing things differently? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think the first thing I would say is that I agree with Councillor Webb with regards to the chronic uh, underfunding generally of local government and therefore that flows through to children's services and many of the very difficult uh, decisions that the council's been making under all uh, colour of administration since uh, 2011. And this particular review doesn't conflate uh, in a sense with that issue, it is about looking at sufficiency uh, and making sure that you're delivering that baseline of service and that you can improve that service. Uh, and that's obviously what we're looking for when that report comes back to the executive. And um, similarly, we did invest a significant amount of money um, through last year's council budget into children's services with the budget, as you know, going up. Uh, but obviously, we'll continue to look at what we can do to improve those really important services. Thank you. Thank you. We come to the end of that section of our agenda. So I will now invite Councillor Aspen to move the recommendation of the Executive to Council from the Executive meeting on the 24th of June, as contained in the minute on pages 51, 52 of the Council papers. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Formally moved. May I have a seconder for the recommendation? Formally second, Lord Mayor. I invite debate on the recommendation. Please indicate if you wish to speak. I don't, I don't see any, anyone indicating. So um, you're, uh, you have the opportunity to reply, Councillor Afton. We'll take a vote. A vote by show of hands. Can I please ask you to indicate? We will be, just bear with me for a moment. Please raise your hands when I ask in a moment to indicate whether you will just vote, vote for, against or abstain in relation to the recommendation all those wishing to vote for the recommendation, please raise your hands now. Looks almost unanimous from here, not quite. Okay, thank you. Those wishing to vote against the recommendation. Any abstentions? Thank you. Point of order, Lord Mayor. Sorry, did I have somebody say, say point of order? Yes, yeah. a Rowley. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Lord Mayor, can I just request, I know obviously it needs other councillors to agree, but in terms of substantive voting, um, can I request that we will come to look at the motion, is that we actually have named votes, the sight lines are very difficult here, uh, and obviously if we had a named vote it wouldn't entail officers having to walk around the room, um, however safe they may be with their masks on. So can I just suggest that when we come to the motions we have a named vote. Thank you. 
there would be that possibility. I was reluctant to uh, suggest that we went for named votes because clearly that would take somewhat longer and we don't want to be in this space any longer than we need to be this evening. Um, but if there are other members who feel strongly that we should take name votes on any particular items, please indicate when we reach that point. I'm not going to rewind uh, that last uh, vote, which I think was unanimous except for one vote against. So that has been carried. Thank you. That concludes the executive recommendations, and I think we've now reached a point where it would be suitable and welcome that we take a break for 15 minutes. Uh, if we can all be ready to start again in 15 minutes, that would be really helpful. I think that would be at 20 minutes past eight, 8.20. Uh, use face coverings um, in communal areas. Um, you may, of course, uh, take fresh air outside. Uh, tea, coffee, refreshments are available for members in the area to my left. Thank you.
Thank you, members. We'll uh, reconvene. Um, before we proceed further, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of things. Uh, during the course of the adjournment, I've taken the opportunity to consider the advice provided by the monitoring officer to councillors uh, Mason and Lomas. Uh, I've also spoken with the chair of the Joint Standards Committee, uh, Councillor Rowley, and Councillor Rowley is content as I am to grant a dispensation to both councillors Lomas and Mason on the basis that it says it is in the interests of the inhabitants of the council's area to allow uh, the members to take part in that item on the agenda. So I do uh, welcome your contributions, um, but I'd also take this opportunity to say, uh, well, remind all members that uh, at all times we need to respect uh, the officers of the council uh, in the way that we address these issues. Thank you. We move on. And I invite Deputy Leader Councillor de Gorn to formally move his written report, which you'll find on page 33 of the Council's papers. I formally um, present the report. Thank you. So, members, uh, the opportunity to question the Deputy Leader on this report. Again, standing orders provide for 10 minutes for questions, comments to the Deputy Leader, who may respond directly or may provide a written answer. If unable to respond in detail, this would be circulated to all council members within five working days. I'm looking for, okay, we've got a number at the moment and over on this side. Uh, Councillor Douglas first. Thank you, Chair. Um... Lord Mayor, sorry. Um, on the question of Piccadilly, the big wide street leading into the city centre, why is the executive member pretending it's still possible to put in segregated cycle lanes when the council's final designs for the street don't include them and the wide pavements that prohibit them have already been built? Thank you. Um, I'm quite happy to answer that. Um, you you probably are aware that um, the um, Piccadilly is sort of adjacent to the Castle Gateway um, project as part of the redevelopment of that whole area of the city. Um, and um, prior to the pandemic, there was uh, significant engagement with um, stakeholders, any members of the public who wanted to contribute their views about the design for that um, for that street as part of the plans, wider plans for Piccadilly and the enhancement of the public realm in that area. Um, during the course of that uh, consultation, there were various iterations of that design and the one which um, has become uh, made available to the public most recently in the last couple of weeks was actually something which was arrived at uh, prior to the pandemic and was uh, due to actually come forward for a formal adoption at one of my decision sessions just after the pandemic uh, commenced. Uh, now, my understanding from talking to officers in, in the light of the, the comments um, that obviously um, became evident during the, that development, one, one um, of the properties fronting onto Piccadilly got planning consent um, with uh, provision for, a, I believe it's called a Section 278 agreement, which is the uh, agreement with the highways department as to what the frontage would be. Uh, and that was based on that d provisional design, as I said. Um, in subsequent to that um, discussion last week, I did uh, have further conversations with officers and it was agreed that the formal adoption of that design should come forward for a decision uh, in the autumn. Um, so although that is, is currently the design which has been um, used, uh, for obviously for the development that is there, that doesn't necessarily mean that that has to be the design going forward. Um, so that's my understanding of the position as it, as it stands to, to this, this point in time. Um, I have indicated as uh, publicly in response to questions that I was asked that I would be willing to look at any 
changes to that design, obviously subject to all the necessary um, practical um, discussion, you know, um, consideration about services and all the considerations that went into the original design. But I have said that I'm willing to look at alterations to that if that seems to be the most effective way of addressing the concerns that have been raised in the last few, um, in, well, in the last fortnight, in fact. Supplementary, if I may. Please. Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, so just to be clear then, does that mean we are going to get segregated cycleways or not? I can't say at this point in time. It, it, it simply means that I have a desire to ensure that we have the best possible provision for cyclists. Um, as you know, I don't know whether I need to declare this an interest, there, but uh, I am a regular cyclist myself. I have used Piccadilly uh, on numerous occasions over the years, so I'm, a, I'm familiar with the, the geography of that area, but obviously I'm not a professional uh, working on the detailed design for uh, Castle Gateway development and for the, the whole area. All I've, I've indicated is that I am willing to look at uh, the feasibility of changes that might accommodate the, con the justifiable concerns of cyclists about uh, a continuous route from the new bridge, which will um, access across the foss. Part of the design is a, a new bridge um, from uh, St. George's Fields Car Park across the inner ring road and over the foss to the uh, Castle Gateway site and, and, and how that connects with the redevelopment of the wider area in the city. Thank you. Um, I saw a number of hands. I think Councillor Warby I saw first. Um, Councillor Webb I know also indicated, and then I'm going to come to Councillor Hook. <laughs> Councillor Warby first. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Earlier last month, I read that York has become the first city in the UK to introduce citywide real-time transport modelling. Could the executive member for transport please update members on this scheme and its potential benefits? Thank you. Yes, um, over a number of, of years now, the um, authority has benefited from um, Department of Transport funding to look at um, the modelling in particular preparing um, for changes in transport that might happen over the next five or 10 years with the advent of uh, connected vehicles. So you know, the, the, the facility for um, vehicles to the more use of ICT in terms of uh, connecting our uh, traffic signaling to um, the, the actual flows of traffic um, and as part of that development, um, that, that work, we have uh, been able to benefit from um, work which will now uh, feed into our real-time um, traffic uh, modelling system so that we're able to, I mean, as, as an example, um, as we all know, if there is a, a, a collision on the the ring road, for instance, that, that maybe traffic is diverted into the city to get around that blockage. Um, the benefit of this system is it means that um, officers who are um, dealing with our traffic flow systems can anticipate what the change in traffic flow will, how it will impact on different junctions in the city and make adjustments accordingly to avoid uh, congestion and pollution as, as far as practical so they can make those in real time rather than just based on what happened the previous time so they can actually take in, into account the full picture of, of the traffic flow and location of, of queues and so on across the city thank you, thank you Lord Mayor. Uh, please thank you um the real-time modeling is is fine but you do need the policies behind that to be able to make real-time decisions mm -hmm. and i think that um, from the conversations i've had with uh, transport officers there really isn't any work being done to actually develop policies uh, a transport plan perhaps uh, that would enable officers to say ah we've got a problem at this junction and therefore we will reroute round here it's all well and good saying and we know what the impact will be 
-hmm. but actually unless we've got a framework or a decision making tool that enables us to use these new technologies they're kind of meaningless so can you explain what work's being done to actually develop policies to sit behind these good sounding strategies but without which they're not really going to add any value well, well certainly that i mean one one of the key benefits of the um, new traffic model will be uh in in actually providing the the basis for our local transport plan four so to actually um i mean we've referred earlier on the, uh, to the the local plan and the envisaged new developments that will be in the next decade um that will actually assist in modeling the impacts um, that those developments will have how that will affect the traffic flows and whatever mitigation we might see to put in so measures uh, or changes to junctions or whatever it might be um that that model is is a far more up-to-date version than what we were working with previously um you know i have i couldn't tell you the, the technical detail but my understanding is that that is is far more accurate and gives us the opportunity to say what if x what if we what if y how would that impact on traffic flows and is that something which would be acceptable or would that have knock-on effects that we'd then want to look at further adjustments to the network I, I would love to take more questions and i had already indicated i would do that but we're through our 10 minutes allocated and uh, already we were running somewhat behind when we took the break as you will have realized um, therefore, I'm going to draw this particular session to a close. Any further questions that remain um, on these issues, by all means, uh, uh, put in, in writing uh, to the executive member. I will move on at this point. So we, we reach item eight, motions on notice. Uh, we'll move to consider the four motions on notice submitted understanding uh, 22 one these are included on the of amendments contained in the agenda supplement. Uh, the first of those are planning systems for residents. Uh, the first motion relates to a planning system uh, working for residents. And before I invite Councillor Dorbney to move the motion, I understand that he wishes to seek Council's consent to alter the motion in accordance with Standing Order 27.1 in order to incorporate the amendment proposed by Councillor de Gorn that appears on the list of motions and amendments in the supplementary papers. If any member does not consent to this alteration, please raise your hand now. Councillor Galvin. Lord Mayor, I, uh, I want to withdraw my ridiculous amendment. <laughs> um, with the support of my long suffering leader who has agreed uh, that I may withdraw it. I'm hoping, Lord Mayor, that you and members of the council will also agree that my amendment be withdrawn. A little word of explanation. I drew this amendment up on Monday morning when quite clearly my brain had not wakened up. <laughs> um, and I looked last evening when I was looking at papers about for today, tonight, and I was horrified, totally horrified, and somewhat embarrassed, I might tell you, to read what I'd put my name to. Complete nonsense. <laughs> uh, having, <laughs> having said that, I'm delighted that it has given members a wry smile. Can I assure you, Lord Mayor, that even if it was not withdrawn, I wouldn't be voting for it. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Galvin, thank you very much, not only for that uh, very, very honest, but also very entertaining contribution. Um, I, I can't imagine for one moment that uh, members are going to take some other view <laughs> on that, but we, we, we do have also just to conclude that uh, agreement that uh, Councillor Daubney has sought. Um, and uh, I didn't get anyone immediately responding uh, that they had any objection, although I did notice your hand, Councillor Galvin, which is why we 
came to you. Can I, can I just be sure that I didn't miss anything previously uh, with agreement to Councillor Daubeny's request? Good, and I'm sure we won't have any uh, who would want to disagree with um, uh, what we've just heard from Councillor Galvin. In that case, Councillor Daubeny, I invite you to move the motion as altered, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I am pleased to have the opportunity to propose the Liberal Democrat motion on rejecting the planning reform bill and instead urging the government to develop a plan that would see local communities at the heart of the planning process. I'm sure each and every one of us in this room appreciates the importance of planning. From creating the communities and facilities that our residents need, to addressing the housing shortage and the climate emergency. Members will be aware that the government introduced a white paper on planning reforms earlier last year. Whilst many of the proposals of the paper are too vague and unrealistic to even discuss, one clear feature running through these unprecedented reforms is a drowning out of our community voices and stifling the local democratic responsibility. Central to the government's plans is the scrapping of the current planning decision-making process in which applications are decided on a case-by-case basis at a local level. Under the new proposals, that would be replaced by a zonal system in which swathes of land would be earmarked either for development or protection. A strong local planning system is an essential component of delivering sustainable development, community cohesion, and a healthy environment. The right development in the right place has potential to deliver social equity and sustainable economic growth, as well as meeting our environmental ambitions. The government's proposals, as they stand, will not achieve these goals and will directly remove our residents and those of us on planning committees from having a say on how our city and communities develop. Removing the right of the public to be heard at in person at local plan examinations, having a say on proposals on a case-by-case -case basis, and many development control decisions from democratically elected planning committees is wrong. Such an approach will lead to an unacceptable loss of local democracy and accountability and lead to worse outcomes for our communities. The plans also threaten to undermine the government's own flagship scheme for involving communities in planning, neighborhood planning, which we have recently seen in progress of the development of the Huntington and Hessington plans. There's clearly a case to be made to make reforms in the planning system and this is an opportunity to build an improved system which leads to a better outcome for stronger communities. But it is crucial that the rush to build, build, build doesn't override democracy and accountability, and the role our residents and we, their representatives, play in local communities. The white paper does not provide a single new right for community participation or a single new opportunity for a democratic moment in the plan making process but rather it reduces both rights and opportunities to participate. We must indeed build, 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 deliver the houses our city and country needs, but we need a planning process that will deliver those houses with community consent, and not give way to developers free for all. I was glad to see several senior conservative MPs urge the prime minister to change course in the wake of the party's defeat in the Cheshire and Amberson by-election. Just in case colleagues need reminding of the stunning upset, the Lib Dems took the Buckinghamshire seat with a majority 8,028 votes of the Tories on a stunning 25% swing. I certainly hope this is a wake up call for the Prime Minister and what local communities think of those plans. I believe that as a council, we must be loud and clear in our absolute rejection of any reforms that we deregulate and centralize a system which is designed for local communities to have their say. I would urge colleagues to support this motion and send a clear signal to your residents that you're on their side. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Daubney. Do I have a seconder? Oh, Councillor Hollier. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to second this motion this evening. Uh, it's almost exactly 20 years since I started my planning degree, pause for gasps. And through my studies and subsequent career in local, plan or local authority planning, uh, I'm no stranger to the constant and accelerating government tinkering with the system. Uh, but this constant state of reform goes back even further. 
the result of decades long tug of war between those who understand the vital role planning should play in tackling some of the key challenges we face uh, from improving public health and living conditions, tackling the real housing crisis and responding to the impact of climate change and those that see it simply as a barrier to the delivery of private sector housing and economic growth. With this conservative government though, any pretense of planning having a wider social or environmental objective has been cast aside. The only voices being listened to are those of the private developers. And is that any surprise when we hear just this week of the Tories unhealthy financial reliance on them for a fifth of their party's donations? Put simply, Lord Mayor, he who pays the piper calls the tune. This is not to say that we do not need reform of the planning system, and repealing much of the last 20 years of reforms would be a good place to start. Uh, trying to think more practically, Lord Mayor, uh, I couldn't help but be reminded of the old joke of the man stopping to ask for directions from a passerby, only to be told that he would be better off not starting from here. Nonetheless, it is clear that the proposals put forward in this motion are a sensible and essential approach if we are to ever return to a planning system that works for everyone rather than just the developers. Key to these must be an understanding that planning is not the barrier to building homes it is presented as being. Nationally, nine in 10 planning applications are approved, while more than a million homes giving planning permission in the last decade have not yet been built, with thousands of these in York. If the government was truly committed to building more houses, they would listen to local authorities such as York, have long called for reforms to be allowed to build more social housing. This includes cheaper loans, access to low priced public land, and the right to keep 100% of the sale price of council homes sold off under the right to buy to invest in housing delivery. And finally, communities should be supported to participate meaningfully in the decisions that affect them. For too long, the public have been seen only as a source of unnecessary delay without any appreciation of how one man's delay is another's exercise of legitimate democratic rights. If the government continues to listen to just the property developers, it can expect more results like Chesham and Amersham in the coming years. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I now open it for debate if members want to uh, contribute. Um, how many have we got? Councillor Carr first. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my, first of all, I'd like to thank my colleague, Councillor Galvin, uh, on the good grace and the self-deprecating humour with which he withdrew his <laughs> amendment. Uh, a little bit of uh, uh, comic interlude there. Thank you, John. Uh, the UK has the second highest population density in the world and is one of the most urbanised of countries, but with the strongest of environmental legislation and a deep romantic attachment to its countryside. It is inconceivable that a planning system based on broad zoning principles as proposed in this wretched planning white paper will work in such a context. This is not the wide open spaces of Canada or Australia, for example. I think the white paper will quietly be shelved, especially after the recent Chesham and Amersham by-election result, where the planning white paper was surely a factor, a deciding factor, as indeed were the effects of HS2, where incidentally a tenth of the budget allocated to that vanity project would fix social care once and for all. However, back to the national planning process, it is sorely in need of streamlining. Our own present local plan started in 2015, looks set for approval, hopefully, in 2022, seven years of debate and argument, millions of pounds of council taxpayers' cost, thousands of staff hours spent on a plan, which in all probability will be overtaken by events in less time than it took to prepare. We have to find a way of keeping plan making local, but speeding it up and I would mention stopping the reprehensible practice by house builders of land hoarding with permissions unimplemented, perhaps by applying a notional council tax on the house builder. And that might in turn, of course, reduce the donations some of the large house builders make to the Conservative Party. I have no real comment to make on the right to buy section of this motion, except to say, I support that statement 
as indeed I do the whole of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I saw a number of hands. I'm going to invite Councillor Douglas, then Councillor Rowley, then Councillor Vassy, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm speaking in favour of Councillor Daubney's motion. Most of us agree the government's white paper is a disaster for local communities. The reduction in the ability of the public to participate in planning decision making and the strengths it offers to developers are not in the public interest. It needs a wholesale rethink and stripping out of measures that will allow developers to build what they want, where they want, with no consideration to the communities they are building in and supposedly for. The Labour group feels this motion shows a lack of ambition. The Lib Dems and Greens are two years into an administration, a time for action, a prime opportunity to tackle some of the planning and development challenges that have stopped the council reaching its targets for housing completions. There is nothing in this motion to address these chronic problems. It is four months since the Labour planning motion was unanimously passed by full council. A motion that called for a permitted development rights direction for application. No action has been taken. The administration seems to have no appetite to expedite this, but here in this motion, we have the same issue included. When our motion became council policy, was it willfully ignored or just forgotten about? While we agree with the contents of this motion, we are very disappointed that it focuses on national issues and not on what the council can do now to improve residents' access to affordable and good quality accommodation. The reluctance of the current administration to seriously consider building 100% affordable homes on its own land and alternative joint venture approaches to financing the building of council properties for social rent is letting down the residents of York and causing our young people to live the city, taking their talents with them. This is once more an opportunity that's been missed. CYC could and should have been building on a larger scale for a number of years. Instead, we're well and truly embroiled in a period when the cost of housing, both rented and to buy, is escalating further. The housing needs of the people of our city is increasing rapidly. The housing list is growing and we simply don't have enough social housing, private rented or homes to buy to go round. 30 seconds. The original motion is blind on the environment and I'm glad to see that Councillor de Gorn's amendment has filled the gap. We will be supporting this motion, but say there is no so much more that could and should be done now by this administration in tackling York's growing development challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Today, we find both Lib Dem motions do nothing positive for York directly and are clearly aimed at deflecting attention away from their own council failings in the city onto topics which have little influence, which we have as councillors have little influence over. Um, this writing letters to government bull really is becoming rather tedious and repetitive. It seems to come with the majority of their motions. Writing to ministers is something they could do anyway without having to ask council to do it. This just highlights it's nothing short of political posturing for the local media. Let's hope residents see through it, and I really hope that they're not wasting officer time and resources uh, in doing these letters. Why don't they just admit they can't come up with anything practical or positive and drop a motion rather than insist on having two to fill council time when they're short on ideas? It would free up some time to discuss and address the issues that council can influence and in, that are important to our residents. Things like ensuring their waste is collected in a timely manner and services run more efficiently. But no, this would highlight just how inefficient this council administration is. On planning, successive governments over many years have failed, including when the Lib Dems were in coalition. The current government are at least attempting to address national housing issues and trying to propose solutions. All major parties acknowledge there is a real house building need in this country, and particularly for genuinely affordable housing. The Lib Dems make a lot of noise, but have no alternatives. 
We could forget the recent by-election in Chesham and Amersham, where they managed to successfully deceive voters, campaigning at a local level against house building, despite their national party policy being pro-mass house building. The saying, we have principles, but if you don't like them, we have plenty of others, must have been devised with the Liberal Democrats in mind. As a party, we won't be buying into this bluff and this deceitful bluster from the Liberal Democrats, and therefore we will be abstaining. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. Councillor Bassey. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the Conservative councillors would rather ignore the contents of this white paper, and I'm not surprised, frankly. Planning has a vital role to play in our response to the climate emergency, both in achieving carbon zero, net zero, and in adapting to climate change. It's critical to delivering the homes we need to end the housing crisis and to deliver the infrastructure and services to support new residents. It's vital for economic development and the delivery of green jobs. There's no doubt that I think all of us in this room would agree that the planning system needs reform as my colleagues have already outlined, but this white paper completely takes the wrong approach. Instead of engaging coherently and clearly with environmental responsibility, we have the promise of a fast track system for beautiful buildings. Who will be the Minister for Beauty, I wonder? Michelangelo Gove, perhaps? <laughs> the idea is simultaneously deeply silly and alarming. And as if that isn't enough, the government seeks to scrap the right to object to any particular development in the future, unless you have fed into the discussion previously, possibly several years before the development you're unhappy with was even proposed. Another genius conceptual artwork, presumably from Boris Kafka Johnson. Locking communities and local councillors out of planning decisions on individual applications will not deliver more homes, better designs, or zero carbon development. Deregulating the planning system by expanding permitted development rights will mean that instead of protecting character and quality, it will be eroded. The proposed zoning system, which we've heard about, would radically reduce protections for nature, local green spaces, and simultaneously fail to tackle climate change. It would place additional development pressure on greenfield sites and produce communities that are less sustainable with a lower quality of life. In a letter to the Prime Minister a few weeks ago, FTSE 100 bosses, academics and sustainability experts pointed out that the proposal did not go far enough to ensure our shared environmental objectives would be met. Instead, Instead of the government's mindless numb thuggery of the planning system, instead of treating the planning system as inconvenient red tape to be swept away, the government should be seeking to make it fit for purpose. The government have been utterly neglectful and ne negligent on low carbon building. We saw them scrap the zero carbon home standards back in 1918, uh, 2018. Superficial, and subjective concepts of Please beauty to close. will not address this and cannot be a core principle. Climate change must be at the heart of the system, Thank you. people at the heart of the process, and zero carbon and delivery and reforms at the key, the key to this Thank you, new Councillor Bassi. to deliver homes for the 21st century. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll be brief. I just wanted to respond to some of the comments of, of Councillor Rowley when he said that the residents of York will not be interested in debates about planning or adult social care. I found that absolutely amazing in terms of a comment. I spent most of my week dealing with a piece of casework of an appalling piece of, of design in a, in a house in one of the streets in my ward. And the only answer I could give to the residents was it was granted planning because previous legislation gave such permitted development rights that planning had no control over it. And in fact, future designs would be significantly worse as a result of the proposals coming forward. That is real world of people living in and it's real impact on lives. And that's why this most is important. And as for that comment about people not caring about social care, again, we'll get more information on this going forward. But the fact that this government continues to pass that burden of social care onto council taxpayers, hacking at frontline services as a result of that burden, putting huge amounts of financial strain on people that can't afford it through an unfair taxation system, 
is the very reason that frontline services are at strain across this country. So I think you cannot take the two things and to say that people aren't interested in social care and planning is just not true. Thank you, Councillor. Um, there are one, two, three, a number who have already Point indicated. of order, Chair. Just, uh, it's nine o'clock already. Can we move I, to the vote? I was just going to say, although there are a number of indicators and they've caught my eye, I do feel we need to move on. I think the direction of this is, uh, is, is fairly clear. So, Councillor Dormley, do you wish to reply? No, thank you, Lord Mayor. So, we'll take a vote. Um, please raise your hands when I ask in a moment to indicate whether you wish to vote for, against, or abstain in relation to this motion. All those wishing to vote for the motion, please raise your hands now. Thank you. Those voting against? Are there any abstentions? That motion is carried. Thank you very much. Our next motion working towards improving democracy and services. Uh, I invite Councillor Doughty to move this uh, this motion which re relates to improving democracy and services thank you lord mayor we all acknowledge the challenges covid19 has brought to the everyday life of our citizens many millions have worked tirelessly and shown resilience without complaint in order to keep help keep the country running there are undoubtedly staff within the council who have worked tremendously hard and we thank those for their continuing efforts and dedication for york residents while not complacent in recognizing the challenges Everyone should be pleased the vaccination programme has been amongst the most advanced, with most adults having received their first vaccination and a sizable two-thirds majority of adults now having had the second jabs. Indeed, it's only Malta and Israel that can in any way claim to be doing better uh, vaccine-wise than the UK. The data continues to show that despite further new COVID cases, the vaccination programme is breaking the link between cases and the levels of serious hospital admissions previously seen. We believe the current council administration now needs to show more ambition in restoring the basic democracy which has been sidelined and improving the basic services our residents expect in return for their substantial council tax contributions raised by the maximum possible in successive years by this Lib Dem council. The council has shown no urgency to properly restore the committee calendar so elected councillors and not just the executive can have oversight and scrutinised decisions being taken. It remains unacceptable for many meetings to take place informally with no minutes publicly available for accountability. Some will claim the committee calendar is available for all to see on the council website and will claim it was shared at group leaders and scrutiny chair meetings with ability to input. It was, but there's little evidence that some of us have been listened to. The formal calendar and not informal forums which have no public access or accountability remains a shadow of its former self and is for the foreseeable future. The frequencies of some remain limited. A quarterly health scrutiny public meeting, for example, when they used to be held mostly monthly. I should point out that I and others, I certainly recall Labour councillors asking too for restoration to as normal a possible structure at several such meetings which had democratic services attendance. This perhaps further highlights why meetings without public scrutiny and or fully accounted minuted documents available for the public to see are needed as soon as possible. While the early months of the COVID were a valid reason, we do not politicise that. After 16 months and working from home for many, there should have been ability to plan for eventualities. Coupled with the removal of most of the rest of the national COVID restrictions this coming Monday, there should be little excuse to restore the frequency previously seen prior to COVID or commence a full open review as to why not or the effectiveness or need for some if it's believed that is in doubt. The council does need to save on taxpayer waste after all, even more so with the COVID related pressures we're constantly told about. Concerning for residents is the continued deterioration in basic services, recently including repeatedly late and in many cases completely uncollected green waste, overgrown vegetation which is once again becoming a problem and deteriorating roads and paths throughout the city. 
to add insult to injury, where fortnightly green waste collections were missed recently in parts of the city, the exact same residents in some cases suffered the same the following fortnight, including in my ward in Strensel. Six weeks between is simply not good enough. We know the Lib Dems will blame Brexit for driver shortages and will no doubt continue to bleat on about it for years to come, rather than look closer to home for their own failings. It is, however, more than five years since the referendum, so with better planning and perhaps some better staff retention measures should have been looked at some time ago. While there may be some staff self-isolating pressures to compound on occasion, it's imperative the same residents do not suffer repeated consecutive failings. Those at planning committee on the 1st of July will recall the plea of concern from the planning consultant working on behalf of the recent Ask and Bryan College planning application. She explained the planning application was well overdue for determination and indicated a sizable portion of the painfully slow 36 week process was down to the working arrangements of CYC and the inability to reach officers by telephone. How long before we see applications taken out of the hands of the council for determination due to such circumstances? Therefore, to due, to, due to some of these concerning issues and to help the city economy recover, we ask council and the current administration to commit to seeking the action points in the motion of fulfilled. 30 seconds. And which I will not repeat as you've hopefully read and can see for yourselves in the papers. I will, however, briefly comment on one of the proposed actions, the first of the bullet points. Whilst behaving safely, we do need to get back to norm normality, although I'm sure going forward that many more people will be able to work from home more to the benefit of all. There are currently too many people working from home. The council is a large employer and local businesses have suffered from the loss of hundreds of customers. The direction of travel we need to take is clear and must start from the Thank top. You. With the council so evidently in chaos, chaos, we need structure and order. And part of this must start with directors in the main working from West offices. I beg to move the motion. Thank you, Councillor Doughty. May I have a seconder? Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased to second this motion. Whilst we cautiously welcome the government's move to lift COVID restrictions from next Monday, we do recognise the desire of most people to get back to some sense of normality. We're being encouraged to um, open and operate businesses as usual get back to our desks and work in the way that we did, but with heightened awareness of personal space, sanitization and cleanliness. Eight years ago, the City of York Council spent over 40 million pounds purchasing and renovating West offices into the flagship groundbreaking facility that it, that it is today. State-of-the-art technology, open plan office space and excellent ventilation these are all things we're being encouraged to make use of as we move forward. This motion seeks to bring back the normal to the City of York Council, its employees and the very residents who it and we serve. No more hiding away, no more unofficial meetings and no more decisions made behind closed doors. It seeks to bring back the right and proper democratic function of an elected chamber and I urge members to support it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. I invite debate on the motion. Councillor Callum Taylor and then Councillor uh, Eyre, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Blimey, right. Um, so, as, as Councillor Doughty touched on, um, there were some Labour councillors on health scrutiny who voiced um dissatisfaction at certain things in, in the current democratic setup that we have because of the pandemic I'm, I'm one of them um i'm not happy with the frequency of meetings or the lack of officer capacity that they can provide at the moment because of the situation we're all in um but we won't be supporting the motion because it, i think it's clumsily worded in parts despite some of the more reasonable uh, frustrations that we think the Conservatives have raised. Um, the main sort of clumsiness comes with that first bullet point. Now, the two councillors who proposed the motion seem to capture some nuance in their words they've delivered tonight, but there's no real nuance in that first bullet point in the motion. Now, we shouldn't be saying work from home for some tasks sometimes Moving forward, yes, we need to have more staff back. Services need them. 
They absolutely do. And in my day job, I get frustrated with so many people behind phones or over email and that lack of face-to-face. -face. Having people back also helps with team spirit. And it also helps with accountability because let's be honest, some people would, if given the chance, love to stay behind the computer uh, in the workplace for as long as they're allowed to, not most, but some. But having said all of that, there's scope for homework in beyond just some tasks are better suited to it. It doesn't work for me. I really don't like it. I hate it. I'm sick of phone charges, laptop charges, and screens all around me in the spare bedroom. But I know it really works for lots and lots of people. People with kids, people with pets. I've got a pet now. He was a lockdown puppy, and he's featured in many Zoom meetings. Um, and, and more homework in, as much as I don't like it, will allow him to have plenty more walks. And it will also benefit those with caring needs who need to be more freely available um, within that day outside of, or within nine till five. So the scope beyond just convenience there. Um, and I think we, we shouldn't be talking about one or the other. So there's a lot of people who say it should be pretty much working from home by default moving forward. And I don't agree with that. Equally, I don't think we should be saying people should be back in the office by default moving forward. There is a genuine middle ground and, and that first bullet point doesn't capture it. And there are still people who are vulnerable despite the rollout of the vaccine. And perhaps within that cohort of directors and senior managers that are cited in the motion, there might be some vulnerable people there. We don't know it. And we're not willing to vote for a motion that might make staff members feel quite deeply unsettled um, on, on this basis. It's not right to back such a blunt proposal this time, especially when the details of the future really need carefully working out for that genuine, flexible, two-way flexibility style of working. The motion doesn't quite capture that, despite the frustrations elsewhere that I agree with. And very lastly, I'm sick of saying this in here, well, in any council meeting, but if conservatives are going to moan about council tax, if they want to be taken seriously, they've also got to talk about the national funding settlement for local government. You can't separate the two. And if you're trying to, you're not fit to be councillors, in councillor, my view. Councillor Taylor, I think that's a slightly different issue there. Well, no, just to, to be fair, so Lord Mayor, the proposer did refer to council tax increases, but I am done anyway. Thank you. Um, and it's good to be back and see you all. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. And it's, it's good to see Councillor Taylor's legs is something that I've not seen for a while. He's very much got them on display today. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Before I begin to address the many inaccuracies and hypocrisies of the motion, I would like to remind the Conservative councillors that we are currently and have been in the midst of a global pandemic for the last 16 months. That's just in case they have forgotten, as parts of this motion suggest. Now on to the motion. In regards to the ask that council meetings are held at West offices where possible, or similar prominent city buildings, if they have a greater capacity. It's as if the Conservative members were describing the current practice. As has been detailed to Councillor Doughty multiple times at group leaders' meetings, wherever possible, the Hudson Room is fully utilised for as many physical meetings as possible, so long as public health guidance and risk assessments are undertaken for the Hudson Room are adhered to. The Hudson Room can safely accommodate a maximum of 18 people, members, officers and public, where a meeting exceeds 18, large venues across the city, the race course perhaps, are being sourced and fully risk assessed so as to ensure physical meetings can take place without impacting on lower member attendance. Transparency for members of the public and without curtailing the agenda. As most members will be aware, meetings have already taken place since mid-May, safely and securely at the community stadium and at the race course where we find ourselves tonight. I have also had two decision sessions held in West Officers. As for risk assessments, these are mandatory for every physical meeting hosted by the council and officers have been clear that if requested, these can be shared with those wishing to see the greater details. In regards to the populist call for more reports on council finances, as members will hopefully recall, full council has already approved the 2020-21 budget after hours of long virtual discussions. This also included the savings required to be made during this and where indicated future years. The Customer and Services Scrutiny Committee already received regular budget updates from the 151 officer 
and have the opportunity to offer in-depth challenge of the Council's finances, as do other scrutiny committees on their respective service areas. I'm happy to say that as per the request of members, this year's budget setting process will be more deliberative and accessible. This is something members will be updated on soon. But in the meantime, the invitation for Conservative members to back York and join our lobby efforts calling on this Conservative government to honour their promises and give local councils the necessary long-term funding is very much still on the table. And finally, I'd like to put on record my thanks for the incredible work of council staff and officers who, just as members have had to, have had to adjust to the new normal. The past 16 months have not been easy for any of us and their dedication and support must be recognised and appreciated. And with that, I will not be able to support a motion which seeks to misrepresent this work. Lord Mayor, point of order, move to the vote. I was about to say we're just coming up to the last few seconds of the time allocated, so I apologise to other members who wanted to contribute. I know Councillor Smalley, um, Councillor Craghill, Councillor Gorn, a number of others have, uh, have indicated, but um, we've given the time allotted, and I, um, I th at this point, happy to put this to the vote. So, <sighs> Councillor Doughty, do you wish to reply? I'll be extremely brief because uh, we do need to move on so other motions can be heard. I'll remind uh, Councillor, we acknowledge the challenges around COVID and we don't uh, politicise that. I'm afraid his administration, however, appear to be hiding behind COVID to avoid scrutiny and accountability. I'll take the vote on the motion. Please, would you raise your hands when I ask in a moment to indicate if you wish to vote for, against or abstain. All those wishing to vote for the motion, please raise your hands now. Thank you. All those wishing to vote against, please raise your hands now. Okay. And those who wish to abstain, please indicate raising your hands now. Uh, it won't surprise you the motion is lost. But we move on um, to the motion fixing social care. I invite Councillor Runciman to move this third motion. Please do so. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased to propose the Liberal Democrat motion urging all members to join our calls to bring forward proposals that will fix social care finances properly. Next Saturday, we'll see an anniversary of sorts it will be two years since the Prime Minister stood outside Downing Street and declared that he had a clear and oven-ready plan to solve the social care crisis. Those in local government might have breathed a sigh of relief, but they were well aware that they'd heard it all before. This was followed by COVID, which became a global pandemic and put unprecedented pressure on both social care and the NHS. Then with, certificate, then with significant support from the voluntary sector, they stepped up to the challenge and kept services going. However, here we are facing the end of lockdown and there's still no plan in sight. Those working in health and social care have gone above and beyond. For councils, finances are stretched to their limits with unprecedented pressure from COVID. Locally, Services are facing a surge in requests as restrictions begin to ease for care and support for older people and people with disabilities in particular. There is a significant demand also for mental health support at all levels, which adds greater complexity to the situation. This administration continues to invest to support social care provision locally, aiming to patch up some of the central government failures in this year's budget, we saw an increase of spending by 2.6 million on adult social care and extra support for children and young people. 
Whilst we invest, government looks away from the extent of the crisis and its effect on our residents. There are only so many sticking plaster solutions that can be used. I think we will all agree that short-term fixes are not the answer. It's clear that depending on council tax, so that residents foot the bill, whilst at the same time cutting local government funding only deepens the crisis. Clearly these pressures and those in recruitment, retention and availability of care staff are not unique to York. However, I believe it's worth saying that at present the system is stacked against us. We must speak with one voice when we call for the long awaited reforms to be delivered. Green and white papers have come and gone. There have been commissions of great minds to assess and clarify the difficulties. But what is required is the political will and leadership not merely to take difficult decisions, but to make solutions that are irreversible. The new health secretary must step up and deliver on the promises of his government. He needs to assure the millions of people who work in these vital services and all those that use them that a solution is on the way. And finally, I'm sure members will join me in thanking those working in the care sector for all they continue to do in incredibly difficult circumstances. The COVID pandemic stopped. One way to make our appreciation clear is by putting party political differences aside and uniting in calling for reform, which seeks to fix this broken system once and for all. Let's have the weight of full council behind this. And please, will everybody support the motion? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Rosman. May I have a seconder? Councillor Barker, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased to second this motion and add some thoughts on what needs to urgently happen to begin fixing the care system. First, as Councillor Runciman explained, we need investment on an ongoing basis to fully move from a historical model of well-being based on care homes and hospitalisation to one of prevention, re-enablement, more appropriate accommodation and community care and support that puts people first and acts on their knowledge and lived experience. Second, we must confine to history the approach of additional one-off grants and in particular, the adult social care precept to fund social care. There are only ever sticking plaster solutions that are unsustainable and hamper longer term planning. Care and support to help people live their best life is a national entitlement and the dependence on our local residents to prop up the failing system is not the solution. Spending commitments needed to address the national crisis in social care have to be made this autumn. Setting out the general direction as the new health secretary has recently com committed to is not enough. We cannot afford to keep going around in circles. Thirdly, as the Future Social Care Coalition has highlighted, there has never been a more urgent time for the government to back a fair deal for undervalued social care workers, the forgotten front line of the pandemic, and help recruit the staff we will need to cope with the growing demand in the years ahead. And finally, as important as it is to protect people from having to sell their homes to pay for care, this will carry a significant cost. Alongside any reforms of this type, we need a solution for bringing more money into social care that is proportionate to the level of ambition we need to have for the future of our care and support. And whilst we might disagree on how this last issue may be addressed, I believe that care reform should not be a political volley. It's about our residents, our families and our communities. And at the end of the day, what we all want, and that is what is best for them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Um, I invite debate on the motion. I see a hand right at the back, but I'm not quite sure whose it is. Yeah. Councillor Looker, forgive me. Yes, it's me. Councillor Thank Looker you very first. much. Um, do you know it's a great pleasure to be back in business? <laughs> um, Welcome. I think you will not be surprised to know that, that the Labour Group will be supporting this motion. Um, and obviously we endorse it, although I would have actually written not just to uh, the new 
Health and Social Care Minister, but I would also write to um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, because quite frankly, unless you will the money to fix social care, merely creating plans will do nothing at all to do it. But at the same time, I have to say that my slightly cynical soul is not waiting with great expectation to feel that the Prime Minister is going to receive this letter on his desk and say immediately, good Lord, the city of York is asking me to do something about social care. Let me get on with it. Where is that envelope on which I wrote my plan two, three years ago? I know it's somewhere among all this stuff I've got. Um, I wish that would happen. Uh, perhaps it will. I, I always wait in hope for things like that to happen but I am not holding my breath. And so in some ways, I, I echo um, Councillor Rowley's um, point that he made earlier um, about the whole thing to planning. One of the easiest things for a council to do is write letters to government. And I can't think how many letters to governments we have written over many, 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 many years from all parties, all groups, all persuasions. Um, but at the same time, what we have to do is also look at what we can do locally. And I agree, sticking plasters are a problem. But sometimes if a sticking plaster is all you've got, then a sticking plaster is what you must use. And you must look to make sure that you are using it in the most creative and the best way. So I think we have to continually challenge ourselves to look at those underlying assumptions that perhaps we've been working on for, for some time, go back, go back again, and revisit some of the ways in which we can, within our own capacity, support the people in the city who need it. Not just the elderly, we are looking at some of the people with disabilities, people with learning difficulties, a variety and a challenging groups of people that we all want to do our best for. And for me, the prime things that keep people fit, healthy and well are actually most of them sitting within local government. Please draw um, to a close. Very quickly, we need good housing, good incomes and good water and Thank you. jobs. So perhaps we can look at some Thank of you. those that are within our capacity to build upon. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Looker. Thank you. Councillor Doughty. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. We all acknowledge the historic and increasing difficulties faced by both those providing social care and those needing support. This is wrong and it needs to be fixed. The Lib Dems know this. They had the care minister in the coalition government. Whilst this is a situation decades old in the making, we are pleased that the government considers its resolution such a priority, it chose to include it in the Queen's speech in May this year. Given the government has already said in its February 21 white paper on proposals for a health and care bill, that it remained committed to the sustainable improvement of adult social care and would bring forward proposals, it seems that yet again, the Lib Dems have sought to raise an issue that is being dealt with, which no doubt they will then want to trade credit for when the proposals are formally made. Slippery to say the least, and what will some say is totally disingenuous from York Lib Dems, calling for something that no will be happening. How many more times will they do this? Accordingly, we'll be abstaining on their motion, not because we don't care, but this is because this is purely a political stunt. Thank you. I haven't spotted any other hands. Councillor Wan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just to address Councillor Doughty's point there, um, social care is not being fixed. Um, the founding principles of the NHS, that no matter who you are, rich or poor, young or old, that you should be able to, to access the care that you need, um, it's fundamentally undermined by the way the current care system is designed. On the question of how to resolve this, um, we might find ourselves on different sides of the argument, uh, but one thing is clear, 
the pandemic has really starkly demonstrated the unequal footing of social care alongside the NHS in this country. The NHS cannot operate in the way we need it to if social care isn't fixed first. Um, this raises major concerns about how the NHS will cope if COVID-19 is something that we have to live with for years to come. Um, there's also a question about how to deal with the huge backlog of care needs, um, how to support rising demand for mental health services, um, and delays to the long-term investment um, in the workforce and the capital infrastructure will also slow the NHS's progress towards recovery from COVID. The political capital that's usually aimed at improving the needs of the NHS must be extended to the care sector, which has suffered most through the pandemic. Um, this must begin with rethinking the new UK immigration system to ensure that care workers can obtain visas and continue to work in the sector. Unpaid, unpaid carers uh, allowance must be raised and local authorities must be provided with the longer term funding settlement that we need. Nine words in a Queen's speech won't do the trick, nor will another commission, nor will another government paper. Um, I hope we would all agree that this needs action now. I would encourage you to vote for the motion. Okay. Councillor Runciman, do you wish to reply? Very briefly, Lord Mayor, um, I'm glad my colleagues have covered the um, other points that I couldn't fit into my five minutes. And I'm particularly glad that Councillor Wan mentioned the workforce, because that is a particular difficulty after Brexit. Uh, I'm really sorry to introduce that word again, but it really is. I think this is a very important motion. It certainly isn't political posturing, and it really means we must put pressure on the government and keep doing it until we get a proper settlement and a proper funding of social care in local government's hands. Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> I'll now take a vote on the motion. Please raise your hands when I ask very shortly to indicate if you wish to vote for, against or abstain. All those wishing to vote for the motion, please raise your hands now. Okay. Thank you. Those wishing to vote against the motion and those abstaining. Thank you. That motion is carried. Our fourth motion, <clears throat> excuse me, ensuring access for all. Um, before I invite Councillor Maley to move the motion, I understand that she wishes to the Council's consent to alter the motion in accordance with Standing Order 27.1 in order to incorporate the amendment submitted by Councillor Rowley as set out in the supplementary papers you have. If any member does not consent to that, please raise your hand now. Thank you, I take that as consent. So I invite Councillor Maley, if you would please move the motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. As altered. Uh, yeah, if I uh, could just start um, in relation to councillors Mason and Lomaz, um, it is useful to know that after private pleas being dismissed, if somebody directly affected by discrimination gives an eloquent enough public speech that the council is capable of complying with very basic parts of equalities law, though I would still argue that there is no conflict of interest to be dispensated against. But anyway, um, yes, I'm proposing the motion on ensuring access for all, uh, and we're happy to accept the Conservative Group's amendment submitted by Councillor Rowley, um, with just a small alteration, please, um, if Councillor agrees. Um, it's just that the word disabled should be replaced with disability in references to the Disability Pride flag and Disability Pride Month. Um, so I'm proposing the motion with those additions, please. Um, this motion is important because for years now, the city centre and other parts of the city have not been accessible enough to a variety of disabled residents for a variety of reasons. 
Um, many disabled people before the pandemic felt excluded from so many aspects of life in York and had to miss out on or overcome barriers to attend a lot of events and areas of the city. Um, listening to disabled people and investing in making the city more accessible hasn't been enough of a priority and that needs to change. The executive member for transport um, said in a council press release yesterday that he intends to debate at this meeting the proposed new blue badge parking spaces in the city centre. Um, that's fine um, if that's still all he would like to talk about, but I would hope that there would be a little more imagination. Um, if you hear the word accessibility and all you think of is foot streets and blue badge parking, then that's why this motion is so needed. Because accessibility is about all our places um, and outdoor spaces, all our infrastructure, and um, it should be a key consideration in everything we do. Um, it needs to be a part of how we design electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, one of the public speakers talked about bus stop distances and improvements that are needed there. Um, buses need to be more accessible. We need more accessible public toilets. We need more public toilets of all kinds, and they need to be better signposted. Um, let's improve cycle storage provision so there's more of it that's more secure and suitable for a wider range of cycle types. We need a proper review of and improvements to city centre seating with more rest stops, um, free rest stops um, and age friendly benches. We need a huge range of accessibility improvements. Yes, there has been a lot of discussion over the last few months about the extension of the foot streets, and we've heard from members of the public um, that earlier this evening who have been directly impacted by how that scheme was implemented. But this motion is about so much more than that and seeks to address a lot of reasons why York is not accessible enough beyond the foot streets issue, so we can make real tangible commitments to improve accessibility of our city for everyone. Many disabled people, as well as local businesses, have benefited from increased pedestrianisation of the city centre. But improvements in accessibility and safety for some didn't have to be at the expense of access for others, especially an already marginalised and excluded group. Our city should be accessible and safe for everyone. And as a council, that should be our ambition and our commitment. That's the purpose of this motion. So please bear that in mind when considering it and the amendment today. There is no innate conflict between different parts of the disabled community that the council needs to mediate. So the motion shouldn't suggest that there is though many disabled people do say they feel pitted against each other by this administration. The council shouldn't try to revise history by suggesting that blue badge holders' concerns could only become apparent because of consultation, when the disabled community were very capable of advocating themselves before the administration ran any sort of consultation. This motion is about centering disabled people in decisions that affect them and giving people agency to advocate for themselves. Don't make this about you and don't use this as an opportunity to pat yourselves on the back for what you've done so far when disabled people have made it clear that that isn't enough and we must do better. This motion needs to be passed as it is without being railroaded by the suggested amendment from a member of the administration so we can make a clear undiluted commitment to being an accessible city and take the practical measures needed to achieve that. So let's pass this motion and not just see accessibility as a mitigation measure to offset against harm, but as exciting improvements to our city for everyone's benefit. Let's not only talk about foot streets and blue badge parking bays at the expense of everything else relating to accessibility. The foot streets debacle can be the catalyst that makes the council finally listen to many accessibility concerns that are in this city and take them seriously. Um, as has been pointed out, um, it's Disability Pride Month right now, the perfect time to fight for positive change. So let's send a clear, undiluted message to actively support accessibility by passing and implementing this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a seconder? Please go ahead, Councillor Crawshaw. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm delighted to be seconding Labour's motion this evening, which sets out a number of ways in which we can be allies to the city's disabled people acknowledging their equal right to access and use our city centre just as non-disabled non residents can. Labour's motion in 2019 called for a healthier, greener city, and it could not have been clearer that any changes to accessing the city centre needed to be done carefully and with a full and meaningful ongoing dialogue between the council and disability advocacy groups, not to mention businesses and other residents. At no point did we call for an entirely car-free city centre, and we were very specific in our wording, calling for the removal of all non-essential journeys from within the city walls. We stand by that sentiment, but have been horrified to see that our 2019 motion has been twisted and used as an excuse to effectively bar many disabled residents from the city centre. That betrayal of its intentions is particularly galling, given the pitiful amount of work that has been done to date on delivering on the more significant aspects of our original motion, in particular the need for a citywide strategy to reduce car dependency across the whole of York. 
At the time of proposing that 2019 motion, we pointed out that done properly, removing non-essential traffic from the city streets would enable greater access for those with mobility issues, and inherent within the motion was an acknowledgement that for some people, despite all the mitigations and reasonable adjustments we might make, a car would sometimes be, uh, remain utterly essential. Having a disability is a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act 2010, and yet we seem to be picking and choosing when we act upon our obligations. Pre-COVID, the city centre was hardly renowned for its accessibility, and I don't accept that reverting back to the pre-pandemic arrangements is the answer either. For example, when the central post office was moved to Coney Street as a result of the um, pre-existing restrictions, it was rendered inaccessible for many blue badge holders before the early evening. The further restrictions which followed the introduction of the ring of steel rendered it completely inaccessible for many. If we were saying that women or black people or gay people all also protected characteristics under the Equalities Act could only enter the city center at certain times of day or under certain specific circumstances, we would all be rightly appalled. And yet in York for too long, we have accepted these restrictions for disabled people. We need to stand alongside the disabled residents of our city as allies. Be clear that they are valued equally and share equal rights to access that non-disabled residents enjoy without even noticing. That may mean hard choices and difficult conversations, but we should not shy away from these, nor pretend the issues do not exist. Nor, was, nor must we send a message to disabled people that they are the problem. The vision of a more accessible, cleaner, greener city has been lost since our 2019 motion was passed. The momentum it generated has been squandered. Let's change that now. Let's stop flip-flopping between excuses for why disabled people are not able to fully participate in their city in the same way that their non-disabled friends and family can. Let's start properly listening and let's accept this substantive motion in full. Thank you. So, can I open this for debate? Is there... Oh, sorry. Forgive me, Councillor de Gaulle. Now, notice has been received of amendment to the motion. I understand uh, Councillor de Gaulle now wishes to seek Council's consent to alter his amendment in accordance with the wording again circulated at the meeting this evening. Uh, if any member does not consent uh, to that alteration, uh, please raise your hand now. Thank you. So I invite Councillor de Gaulle to move the amendment as amended, uh, as altered. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd firstly like to thank Councillor Melly for the time and effort that has clearly gone into drafting this motion on an important issue for York. The amendment I'm proposing is very much intended to, to enable us to seek consensus on tackling the challenge of making our historic streets not designed for vehicles, let alone social distancing, both safe and accessible for all. The changes this administration made a year ago in response to the government direction and the short notice changes at the end of the first lockdown were clearly made without opportunity to consult, but have been vital to the survival of much of the hospitality industry. They were swiftly followed with significant engagement, both before the executive decision in November 2020 and subsequently to inform a strategic view of city centre access and parking to find out what is working and what we need to do differently. The benefits of extending the foot streets and enforcing the car free hours have been felt by many businesses and customers, including many with mobility difficulties. We are getting a clearer picture of a negative impact on others through the activities such as the seven online theme workshops with over 100 participants the, our big conversation questionnaire is sent to all households and extensive social media engagement. We've also worked with the York Disability Rights Forum, Blue Badge Holders and disabled groups to engage with a total of 421 people, including advocacy groups um, representing thousands of members. This allowed detailed discussion to take place with those who wish to engage in depth. In total, there were 1,900 responses and the November decision was informed by broad support indicated through that consultation to the extensions for foot streets, uh, with 67% overall in favour and 61% of those respondents who identified as having a disability also indicating support. As indicated through our amendment, the areas proposed for review in this motion 
are already being considered within the ongoing strategic review coming to the executive in the, in the autumn and can help to shape the proposed actions to mitigate the impact of these changes. Formal consultation, as was referred to, has just started, um, although that is quite clearly not the only uh, aspect that we're looking at in this motion. So the formal consultation has started on uh, additional parking spaces for Blake Street, Deangate, Duncan Place, and various other parts of the city centre. These are an important first step to further measures that enable us to cater for a wide range of disabilities in the most appropriate way. Work is also going on into researching other measures such as, such as shuttle services, teeth around that, improved shop mobility scheme, safer access routes to priority car parks, resting points, accessible bus stops, and so on. Uh, as with all things, the council has to balance and mitigate the differing needs of individuals, and I call on all parties to work together to find the best inclusive solutions for the City of York. Please support the amendment. Thank you. May I have a seconder? Councillor Ayer. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to second this amendment, similarly to Councillor de Gaulle, thank the residents, businesses and opposition members for their engagement in this ongoing work to improve accessibility in the city centre. We all appreciate the difficulties that this pandemic has presented to us as individuals, as well as councillors and city leaders. I will not waste my time reminding members of the context in which Foot Street extension had to be implemented to save local businesses, but it's worth once again noting that this decision has affected many different communities in different ways. It's undeniable that the revision of the city centre Foot Streets has played a significant role in supporting a considerable amount of businesses during the period in which they have faced restrictions that have significantly impacted their ability to trade. Although overall the Foot Street extensions and longer hours have been welcomed by most businesses and were supported by York Retail Forum and the York Bid on behalf of their members, we are well aware of the challenges this has brought to other residents. It's a fine balance that must be found so that decisions made affect our residents as positively as possible. Councillor de Gaulle already noted the extensive amount of work that is taking place to address these, so I will not dwell on this. However, as with all council projects, we must be mindful of the practicality, budgetary constraints and indirect consequences that our decisions have. Wanting to have your cake and eating it is a wonderful ambition, more and more frequently practiced by the Labour councillors. However, for those few that remember what it's like being responsible for decisions, not simply criticising them, it's clear that these decisions are made within the reality and context of the existing constraints. A part of this reality is also the legacy of the last Labour administration, which by the looks of this motion, not many opposition members will recall. Councillor Crawshaw referred to the restrictions and the inaccessibility of pre-COVID city centre. That was a Labour flagship policy that introduced that and one which they have always stood by. I would also like to thank the public speaker earlier on, I think Roweth, who referred to Councillor Jeffries, who was a very close friend of mine, a committed campaigner for the social model of disability, who left the Labour group and joined the Liberal Democrats because of our commitment to that social model of disability, not tokenism. For that move, she was shamelessly, shamefully labelled by that administration as a bad apple. It's a real shame that we don't have her with us today. It is the privilege of the opposition to criticise without any responsibility to deliver. But on this major issue that affects our residents, I would urge the opposition members to refrain from making accessibility a party political issue and work together to find the best solutions to the challenges facing our city. Thank you. I'm very conscious of the time and we do need to move on. Um, whilst I'm happy that we debate this, the more we debate it, the less likely we are to get to um, the point we need to this evening. Um, so could you respond briefly, Councillor Perrot? Uh, sorry, I miss, I, I, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm not going to dignify the comments about having one's cake and eating it um, with a response taking time that we can ill afford. I would, however, want to make some comments on this amendment. This amendment is clearly aimed at taking all of the positive actions out of the motion. And this in itself is further testament to the disdain with which disabled people are treated by this administration. 
This amendment seeks to remove the requirement to act to make reasonable adjustments to avoid discrimination. This amendment removes all of the criticism of the Council's approach to date and will consequently fail to put anything right or to change any future approach to considerations of access. This amendment astoundingly seeks to rewrite history by suggesting that disabled voices have been heard and that it was not only due to the relentless campaigning of disabled people and their allies that the administration even bothered to start a consultation many weeks after the changes to access had already been imposed. This administration really must learn a lesson. To get something wrong is human, but to try to pretend it never happened and to attempt to gaslight those who were harmed by your mistake is unforgivable. I urge now all of those councillors who approach me in the break to express solidarity with me and Councillor Mason about the discrimination against us this evening to reject this amendment, do the right thing and show disabled people in York that you are listening to them on accessibility. Thank you. Again, I know there are others who want to comment, but I'm very, very conscious of the time. Councillor Melly, do you wish to reply at this point? Are you, are you, are you content that we take a vote on the amendment? Um, can I just respond very briefly, um, just to say that I just wanted to echo what's been said by the public speakers um, and by members, um, and just add that I've been contacted by disabled people since this amendment was published, um, people who are very angry and hurt and I've called it gaslighting to rewrite history like this um, and to basically take the voice away from disabled people and use this as, as an opportunity to try and falsely paint the council in a good light. As a public speaker said, it, um, this amendment is not to protect disabled people, but to protect the council's decision. Uh, it was not the intention at all of this motion to do anything party political, but just to act in good active solidarity with disabled people it's been made party political by the two parties proposing this amendment to to rip this motion to shreds and take away the meaning from it thank you lord mayor i thank you thank you can i seek the the, the pardon of council i i'm advised that we have a little more time than i thought we had i i felt we were um with the other items on the agenda up against the why here and it would be appropriate to, to have a little more input. Again, I will give you the opportunity to, re to respond, Councillor Melly. Uh, but if you will allow me, um, Councillor Smalley, please. As, as I say, I, I thought the pressure of time was a little, uh, little more than it, than it is. I'm advised that it would be good and helpful to Council if this is uh, debated just uh, a little more. Councillor Smalley. I hope this is, ah, it is on. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. As Exec Member for Equalities and Chair of our City's Human Rights and Equalities Board, I'd like to echo the commitment of everyone in this room to make our city more accessible and welcoming to all. I'd also, again, like others in this room, like to thank the public speakers for their important contribution this evening. As the UK's first human rights city, York is at the forefront of championing a vibrant, diverse, fair and safe community. Our journey to be a rights-respecting city started with our declaration and it will and must continue. Nonetheless, our city has a great heritage of supporting equality and diversity, and so we must continue in this spirit to address the complexities that the pandemic brought about, as well as the underlying systemic inequalities embedded in society. Accessibility and disability rights is not owned by any political party. It's not a, a Labour issue, a Conservative issue, a Lib Dem issue or Green issue. We are all striving to make our city as safe and welcoming and accessible as it can be. I'm happy to see this amendment seeks to remove the notion of making accessibility a political volley and instead urges members to work together and support residents rather than score political points. To describe this amendment as a wrecking amendment does a disservice to the original motion. I would urge all members to support this amendment so we can move forwards with addressing the concerns of residents for the good of our city and everyone who calls it home. Thank you. 
Councillor Smalley, do you wish to make any further response or happy that we move to the vote at this point? Councillor Crawshaw. I think that's Councillor Crawshaw. Yes, yes. He just put his hand up and you just said Councillor Smalley. Sorry. Sorry. Forgive me. Councillor Crawshaw. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm, I'm genuinely appalled at what I am hearing. We have been contacted by numerous members of disability advocacy groups and blue badge holders and others since Councillor de Gorn's amendment was published. People are absolutely horrified by what you are seeking to do to this motion. It would appear that you have absolutely no concept of the impact that these changes have had on disabled people and you clearly don't understand your obligations under the Equalities Act. There are two points at the top of this motion in the council notes that you have taken the wording out and changed. That was wording that was specifically asked to be put in by members of disability advocacy groups. The reason being that case law states that we have an obligation as a council to enable people to get as close as reasonably possible to where they want to be. To remove that point is to ignore case law on the Equalities Act 2010, as is removing acknowledgement that online services are not a substitute for access. That, that latter point was ruled by the Court of Appeal in the Royal Bank of Scotland versus Allen 2009 in which a bank was found to be in breach of the reasonable adjustment duty because its main branch in Sheffield was not accessible to wheelchair users. The court ruled that, quotes, even if banking services could be accessed in alternative ways, such, such as over the internet, the policy of the Disability Discrimination Act was to provide a service as close as reasonably possible to that achievable to people generally, which included physical access to branches. All through your amendment, you're seeking to take out the words of disabled people in the city. And the most unforgivable of all is the point where you remove the line around clearly stating that we are obliged not to set one disability group against another or privilege one type of disability group over another. Again, that is specific wording that people asked us to ensure that this council endorsed so that they could feel reassured that this administration got where they were coming from. The council, you, you've asked us instead to say that we should mediate between the disability advocacy group. There's no argument to arbitrate. The different disability advocacy groups and the different advocacy groups across the city around accessibility are all speaking to each other. They're making sure that each other knows what the council's up to because the council isn't telling them what we're up to. And all the way through, they're fighting to have their voices heard. And if we accept Councillor de Gorn's amendment, which twists a motion that was intended to show disabled people in our city that the, that the council can be their ally and work with them to find solutions, into a motion which seeks to invalidate their concerns and downplay the issues, Please draw to if we place. vote in favour of that, we will be harming relations between the council, the executive member, and Thank many, you. many people in the city who simply want to be able to go about their daily business just like Thank their non-disabled friends Thank and you. family. Thank you, Councillor Crawshaw. Councillor Doughty. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, the amendment clearly trashes the entirely reasonable and very easy to support motion from Councillor Melly, rendering it meaningless. That it's disabled residents who will suffer by not having the aims of this motion fully explored and acted on as a disgrace on party politics, when this is something that could and should have had widespread support. A speaker referenced the late um, Councillor Lynn Jeffries, someone I had huge respect for, and I often think uh, about what would Lynn say when considering disability access and policies in York. I think she would have been very, very disappointed in this amendment. The Lib Dems can, of course, prove us wrong and rescue some credit by voting down the amendment and support the main motion as proposed by Councillor Money.
Thank you. Well, the chair moves to the vote, it's 10 o'clock. Councillor Murphy, do you wish to make a final response? No, thank you. Thank you. Then we'll move to the vote on this. Yes. So with regard to the amendment, um, Please raise your hands when I ask in a moment if, to indicate whether you wish to vote for, against, or abstain in relation to this amendment. All those wishing to vote for the amendment, please raise your hands now. Okay. Thank you. Those who wish to vote against the amendment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And if you would please indicate if you wish to abstain. Yeah. The amendment is carried. Thank you. I now invite debate on the motion as amended. So we move on. Councillor Murphy, do you wish to reply at this point? I think it's all. I think it's all been said. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Webb, please. I think that was me, Lord Mayor. Um, I have to say this motion as amended really does show Councillor de Gorn and the Greens for, for what they are. To put it in cycling terms for Councillor de Gorn, the Greens have become a very small rusty cog whose teeth have been blunted by the Lib Dem penny, penny farthing. I mean, you look at what's been taken out now and there's something here about reducing car dependency that has been removed. What kind of green are you? Turns out a bit of a yellow one. I think if you look further on about what else has been taken out, the word implement, for example, that's been removed. Again, it's proof that this motion has now completely lost its teeth. This is a case in point of the inaction of the Lib Dem Green Coalition. Thank you. Councillor Lomas. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have to say I'm disappointed, if not entirely surprised, that those councillors who did express their solidarity with me during the break did not feel able to prevent this travesty. It is absolutely clear that anything of any substance in this motion has been removed in the attempt to rewrite history and I hope that residents watching this at home will not allow that history to be rewritten and will remember what has been done today. The Labour group will be voting against our own motion because of this extraordinary display by the um, administration. Councillor Craghill. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have to come back on some of these comments that are coming from Labour. Um, you know, you are making this issue into political football. Whilst claiming to be standing for disabled people in the city, you are actually making it into a political football. Um, and, and I just cannot um, 
support the fact that you're doing that, you're creating a narrative that isn't accurate and doesn't actually reflect what is happening. There's a huge amount of good stuff, good suggestions in your motion. And I would say that if the amendment had fallen, I would probably have been still likely to vote for your motion unamended. But I think that what is in this motion, um, it's not accurate to say that the amendment has taken the body out of it. We can take your suggestions and go forward with them. And I think we certainly should. And, and, and I really hope that we will. Um, I don't think in any way we're taking away the voice of disabled people. I think there is a big challenge here. And I understand that some people do feel that their voice hasn't been fully heard. But I think you, you heard Councillor Dagorn set out much earlier on the um, extensive consultations that have been going on through my city centre. Those have been with disability representative groups, with individuals, in all kinds of different ways. And a report on that will is still to come forwards. And I also think, finally, it's important that people listening should understand that your motion, unamended, did not actually suggest making changes to the substantive proposals on the foot streets. And I do think that disability groups listen to this, should understand that. You weren't actually suggesting that. So by amending your motion, we haven't, um, you know, lost anything on, on that in that score. Um, I really think this is something that we should be working together on and not, not having this sort of discourse. Thank you. We, we're out of time on this motion. Councillor Melly, please, if you want to make a final comment. Yeah, just that you say that you want, you want to go forward with the suggestions, but this amended motion or new motion, which really is what it is, it's completely different from what was originally proposed, doesn't include a commitment to go forward with any new suggestions at all. It's basically just a pat on the back to yourselves for a job badly done and a commitment to carry on with what you already had planned. And it really, really wasn't our intention to have any sort of party political dispute. We really are just doing what's in the best interest for the people of York and naively thought that maybe you had the same interest. Thank Point you. of order, Lord Mayor. Sir. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I've noticed Councillor Fitzpatrick has raised her hand tonight about three, maybe four times and hasn't been asked. I don't know if it's because she's at the back of the room and and maybe she's not wearing the loudest of colours. We can work on that in the future. But could we afford a, a short speech, given that she wants to, she clearly wants to speak on this item and has been overlooked for whatever reason? Uh, I can assure you that I hadn't seen that, uh, Councillor Fitzpatrick, and it isn't that easy in, uh, in this space, as I'm sure you will, will appreciate. At the same time, I'm, I'm conscious that um, we are at the point now where we need to move on with this. Uh, we've given it the allotted time and a little more. So I can only offer my apologies, Councillor Fitzpatrick. Um, it's by no means deliberate, um, but we move on. I will now take a vote on the amended motion. Uh, please raise your hands when I ask in a moment to indicate whether you wish to vote for, against, or abstain in relation to this motion. All those wishing to vote for the motion as amended, please raise your hands now. Thank you. Those wishing to vote against, please raise your hand now. Thank you. And again, if there are abs abstentions. Thank you. Okay. 
So the motion as amended is carried, thank you. That concludes the section on motions and we move on to questions of the leader or executive members. Can I just take a moment to take advice here in terms of the time that's still available to us? And at what point do we need to be back? Not going to be night fourteen. Okay. Thank you. I invite uh, members to question the leader and executive members in respect of any matter within their portfolio responsibility, according to Standing Orders 17, 18, and 21. Please can you address the Lord Mayor with your question, speaking clearly, indicating to which executive member you wish your question to be directed. Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, it's a question for the Executive Member for Finance and Performance. Um, many of us seen, seen in the press in recent days coverage about proposed uh, significant changes uh, in the Coney Street area, including the provision of a riverside walkway and bridge. Um, could the Executive Member please share with us some information about these, more information about these proposals, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, I think our city beautiful, for those of us who remember it going back a time, one of the visions that was done for the city made that very clear, clear statement that we're a city that turns its back on its river rather than looking forward to it. And that's something that's been an aspiration of the city, I think, probably longer than our city beautiful, probably 50 years onwards. It's something that has always been difficult for the city to achieve. And I think now we're at that point where we have a significant opportunity due to both commercial investment and investment by the council in the area. We were successful in securing funding from the York and North Yorkshire LEP to do a feasibility study, which has allowed us to look at three different sections of that Riverside Walkway alongside the Guildhall. There was the option for a new bridge, which would link to York Central and provide a, a better access to the York Central site rather than putting both cyclists and pedestrians across Lendl Bridge. At the moment, that is particularly difficult and not something that we can progress with the funding we have available. There was also the option of a floating patilla platform across the, the Guildhall section again something with huge complexities that is not possible to, to move on as quickly as we would like, but something that will go into the, the future transport planning. What we have been able to do due to the, the timing of certain developments within the Coney Street area is look to work with commercial partners at building that, that Riverside walkway from that section to extend from, uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention the name of the pub, but a certain public house on the river up to Ouse Bridge. And uh, it will take a significant amount of investment. There is a significant amount of private investment but we are putting a bid into the government's levelling up fund, which we were told today, I think, by Boris Johnson, that we are a tall poppy that does not want to be cut down. So we, we should have to be very optimistic about our chances of securing that funding, which will allow us to complete that. Thank you. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my question is to the executive member for play areas. And I'll be honest, after recent antics, we're not sure who that is. Um, we have read the uh, executive members' various public pronouncements on the need to fill in a five-minute form to apply for play area funding. Given council officers' guidance to Labour councillors that some play areas in wards they represent are so bad that they would qualify for funding on the basis of need, as originally set by Councillor Smalley in 2019, does that executive member now understand why his decision to quietly change the rules midway through the process will leave kids and their families in these areas feeling abandoned by the Liberal Democrats. Uh, thank you, Councillor Webb, for that question. I think I've, I've been an exec member, I'm very fortunate to be an exec member for just over two years now. And already you sort of start to look back over you know, what, you've, what you've achieved, what you're still working towards. And I can honestly say the play area improvement funding is one of the proudest things I've been involved in of this administration, an absolutely fantastic scheme. And I'm and obviously still still very much enjoying um, the work and seeing seeing that that project come to fruition, despite the best efforts of some um, in your group. And um, as with so many projects, the, pa the pandemic changed the original plan, which would have seen £150,000 of the funding used to survey the city's play areas. Whilst restrictions meant that this project had to be put on hold, the £100,000 community pot was launched with councillors, community groups and parish councils and other organisations urged to submit bids for improving their local play areas. The response to that community pot was incredible. The project was three times oversubscribed, 
highlighting the demand across York for better play equipment. Given the number of applications, clearly the scheme was well understood by community, par community partners and well received. In order to ensure that as many play areas benefited from improvements as possible, it was decided that 75,000 of the 150k surveying budget should be redirected to the community part. I should make clear that that surveying budget was for the whole city, much at the same that this play area community challenge part was. This ensured that more direct improvements will be made right across York, ensuring that schemes submitted were still financially feasible on a 59% contribution. Without that extra funding, lots of those schemes that people had submitted for would not have been financially feasible. When you add in what community partners are co committing to their projects alongside the 175,000 match funding from the council, over 400,000 pounds, almost half a million, is set to be invested in the city's play areas. That's the largest, I would dare to say that that's the largest single investment the city's ever had ever in its play areas. I think that's something really to be quite proud of as a city. This substantial investment will go a long way to support local community organisations in making big improvements to local facilities. And if I can, Lord Mayor, before I wrap up, the sad fact is many Labour councillors complaining about that, this fantastic scheme did not bother to apply. You didn't. Some did, some were successful, and thank you to the council who isn't here at the moment because they've left, but who did get in touch with me privately to raise concerns who I've had a meeting with since. Thank you to them. Fortunately, many other councillors and community groups did not sit on their hands and took action to ensure that their areas will receive major cash boosts from this council scheme. As ward councillors, we are all well aware of which play areas in our, in our patches need that investment. So whilst Labour councillors spend their time writing press releases, Lib Dem councillors will, and others will get on with supporting their local communities. I know that local residents will appreciate the hard work and focus on action rather than the desperate headline chasing, which now seems to be the only function of York's Labour Party. Thank you. Su Lord supplementary, Mayor. Lord Mayor. The guillotine. We are informed to finish at 10.30. Because of the because of the break that we had. That, that was my my confusion earlier, which was trying to move us on. I thought we were aiming for, for 10 o'clock, so you'll understand that uh, I was thrown by that. Um, where was the supplementary? Over here, Lord Mayor, Councillor Taylor. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm pretty stunned to hear that Councillor Smalley's sees the park's improvement bidding process as one of his most proudest achievements. It's an absolute dog's dinner. And I'm, I'm interested to uh, hear what he'd have to say to community groups and councillors' bids, like one that I was involved with, who spent hours, hours in the bid together on the basis that it was going to be competitive. If the lead executive members going around on Twitter saying all it took was filling a form for five minutes, both both types of bids have got the same percentage for the most part. How do you square that to the people who've really put the graft in for the parks they care about if it was just really a five minute form? I, I can respond, Lord Mayor. Briefly. Um, perhaps I'll accept with hindsight, absolutely, each bid took longer than five minutes. Both two parish councillors in my ward, I obviously excused myself from their process of bidding. I recognise exactly what you said in terms of it did take you know lots of time, lots of consultation with communities, and on the point that it you know it was a competitive bid. Four bids were not um, were not accepted because they did not meet the criteria. However, since then, officers have worked with those community groups to find other sources of funding. I can see the member involved shaking their head because that, in agreement, I should say, because actually you know that that showed how it is a competitive. It was a competitive process. I am very proud of what it's achieved. And if I can, I would really like to go around every single of the 26 beneficiaries, seeing what that investment take place. Yes. It is fantastic. Personally, I'll be lobbying for more investment in the future into play areas. I think this has started a discussion and a debate on just how much we need to invest in play for the future. But I, but I, th I hope I've answered your supplementary question. Supplementary. Yes, I know. I'm going to come to Councillor Musson. 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and thanks, Councillor Smalley, for your reflection on your pride in your first two years. I hope you look forward to your tour of the York Outer Wars to visit all the, the play areas. Um, I think in changing the rules, it's difficult to include anything other than that Liberal Democrats don't think that kids in Aiken, Westfield and elsewhere deserve decent play opportunities. And that much is clear when you look at missing equipment in play areas and what that means for kids in these areas, are you still convinced that awarding funding on a competitive only basis, mostly to Lib Dem wards, was the right decision to make and something that you are specifically proud of? And I also want to respond to your point about councillors not bothering to apply because you know for a fact, and people have already raised, that bad advice was given to members in specific wards telling them not to apply or not to put in more than one bid while Lib Dem wards you know, some multiple per ward put in multiple bids. So I'll, I'll start Can with- Councillor Smalley, do you wish to respond to that? Yes, please. Um, I'll start with the first bit. Uh, uh, no, I think I absolutely think, I, I mean, with, with if we could, as, and we've talked about how local government funding has been reduced and, and um, decimated over the years, we'd still have a, a large play area team of people. As it is, we have, We've just recruited, so we now have a team of two, um, which is more than many councils have. Um, I know one council where uh, a relative of a councillor has nobody who looks after play equipment and no budget for, for repairs. We have both. And I, and I think um, when you look across communities, and you mentioned Aiken, we're, we're expanding an already fantastic library in Aiken. And I, and I know there's lots of play areas that, that do require improvement, and 26 of them have just benefited from this massive investment. And I think with you ask about my hindsight i think we've we've strategically invested um, a quarter of a million pounds and with that we've managed to secure using you know the, the fantastic work of local communities ward funding parish councils and others for over four hundred thousand pounds i'd say that's a pretty good return on investment thank you i'm i'm going to move on um Item 10, report of executive member. Uh, a written report by Councillor Woodison, the executive member for environment and climate change, appears on page 55 of the papers. I invite Councillor Woodison to formally move receipt of her report. Formally moved, Lord Mayor. May I have a seconder? Councillor Rowley. For, for, formally seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I now invite members to question Councillor Woodison on her report. May I remind members that standing orders allow 10 minutes for questions. We don't really have 10 minutes. <laughs> we hardly have any time at all. Um, members uh, are aware, of course, that questions can be put uh, and may reserve a, a, a written response. Um, Councillor Kilbane. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief, as brief as I can. Um, briefer than Councillor Smalley anyway, I'm sure. Um, I was interested to read your opening line with regards to, and I quote, improvement in waste services. I just wanted to check that I had read that right, um, because I don't think it's a description residents experience in the service of late will recognise. Will the executive member accept that this statement is well wide of the mark, given the residents' recent experiences, and I believe it's now over a month since you have managed to complete a successful day's collections. Councillor Cobain, many thanks for your question. There are issues with the waste collection currently, and they are well known across the country. Indeed, today, Liverpool Council have suspended their green waste collections until August due to the ongoing shortages of HGV drivers. The Road Haulage Association have estimated that there is a shortfall of 100,000 drivers from the pre-pandemic total of 600,000 drivers. And on average, it's taking eight weeks to recruit anybody. Along with Liverpool Council, there are many other councils, some of which I'll name here, Somerset, Derbyshire, Aran Haven, South Oxfordshire, London Borough of Sutton, hitting the national news that they cannot collect garden waste. On top of the councils, we've also got Tesco, Haribo, building suppliers such as Browns and Hughes and Gray reporting major issues across the supply chain. 
The Institute of Grocery Distribution are saying that the shortage of drivers is affecting fresh deliveries across the whole of the country and food supplies. So why is this happening? Because I agree, it is a real issue that we are trying to address, Councillor Kilbane. COVID is having an impact regarding driver tests, which are running 30,000 behind their normal limits. Allied to that, 15,000 European truck drivers left due to Brexit. Why did Brexit have an impact? Because people think we overuse that term. Well, the reason it's got an impact is we, the UK, changed the tax position for the European drivers. It made it uneconomical for them to operate in this country. So they left. The Haulage Association and many other bodies are calling on this government, central government, to put them in, I've forgotten the term now, it's a, a status, um, let me see where I've got it written down. I don't know what I've done with it. So the status where it's actually, it's a named shortfall of a provision so that we can employ European citizens in that role. We are working long and hard in this city to make sure that the drivers can come up, can deliver and that they are working extra hours. We're aware that the central government doesn't take the same issue seriously. We had Grant Chaps tweet a week ago, basically saying that he would just extend the hours so that we could harm health and safety. In other words, his health and safety was to be diluted so that we can deliver rather than tackling the issues that the Haulage Association have highlighted. To answer your question regarding this, the waste team, they are being heavily impacted for recruitment and retention. More drivers and loaders are needed. We are talking with, work with York. We are talking with all secondary recruiters and we have been recruiting for over three to four months. So just so that you're aware, we have every action put in place to try and collect the green waste. Unfortunately, due to the national position, along with Liverpool Council, we are not collecting the garden waste as much as we would like to be. Thank you. Supplementary. I think given the time, I really need to conclude. There are several other items on our agenda, uh, all, of, all of which, um, because of time, uh, would, uh, would pass as read, except the item which would have been item uh, 14, and I'm bringing that forward because we do need to make this specific vote uh, this evening, and we only have minutes left. Um, as members will be aware, there are votes required to confirm the membership of Audit and Governance Committee and uh, Economy of Place Scrutiny Committee. I propose to take these separately. In respect of Audit and Governance Committee, two nominations for the vacant seat have been received, namely Councillor Rowley and Councillor Carr. Uh, I will now go to the vote on that. We have quite simply a choice. It is a two horse race. It is first past the post. Therefore, um, I'm simply going to ask the, uh, for those who would uh, wish to, uh, um, the Councillor Carr filled that position, please raise your hand now. Yes. <laughs> You're allowed to vote, Councillor Carr. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for Councillor Rowley. Point, point of order, Lord Mayor. I wish to withdraw my nomination for that position. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. Okay. So we, we have uh, then dealt with the Night Centre Economy, uh, Economy and Place Scrutiny Committee. Uh, quite simply, Councillor D. Taylor has now confirmed his intention to take up the seat offered to him. Uh, so um, it's really a formality to show by uh, a vote by show of hands. Point of order, Lord Mayor. Um, while we support Councillor Taylor's appointment onto this committee, while the committee remains 
in its constitution, unlawful in our view. This There is no majority party in this council. It is a hung council. You cannot have a majority uh, party on anybody uh, in our view. Uh, we will be voting against this appointment, but uh, it's nothing personal against Councillor Taylor, who we think is excellent on economy in place, and we are happy for him to be there, but we cannot approve this committee as constituted. Do you need to make any comment? Yeah. We can't spend any more time on this, therefore we move to the vote on this. Just give me one moment. Lord Mayor, just um, uh, for the sake of clarity, I have obtained external legal advice in respect of this matter. The external legal advice receives confirms that as the Economy in Place Scrutiny Committee is not an ordinary committee, um, the rules of proportionality set out six, section 15A do not apply. The principle is that we need to keep as close as possible to the um, reality by virtue of deviation. This means that the, the scrutiny committees, which have member seven, are subject to the same deviation in the same principles. And therefore, the legal advice that I've received is it is acceptable to the council additional Liberal Democrat seat. The additional Democrat, Liberal Democrat seat at annual council was indicated as four seats in the Economy and Place Committee. Um, the clarity around the vote this evening is the place for Councillor D. Taylor, because at the time of the annual council, I needed to be confident of the instructions that he was providing to annual council. Those have now been received. There is no other committee that requires a vote in respect of its allocation of seats. And therefore, the current composition of economy in place, in accordance with the legal advice that I have received, is lawful and the position remains um, as indicated for the remainder of this municipal year. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Point Thank of you. order, Lord Mayor. We move to the vote. Point Those of order, Lord Mayor. In favour. Point of order, Lord Mayor. As the chair of the Customer and Corporate Services and Scrutiny Management Committee, I would like to formally record that whilst uh, external legal advice has been sought, it is heavily caveated. It makes clear that it is an opinion and there are twice caveats within it that state that other legal opinion would recognise that the spirit and purpose of the proportionality legislation has not been met. Therefore, we sought external legal advice, which said that they were quite happy Councilor that Crossshaw, an opinion in the opposite direction could Councilor quite Crossshaw, easily be sought. This is not a point of order directly relevant to the item of this agenda. It is directly relevant the to the proportionality of the committee and the appointment to that the committee. And I wish to record as the chair of the, of the Scrutiny of Management D. Committee Taylor. that I believe this Thank to you. be an inappropriate Thank allocation. You. Thank you. We move to the vote. Those in favour, please indicate. Thank you. Those who wish to vote against, please indicate. Thank you. And are there any abstentions to register? Okay. Councillor Taylor is appointed. Thank you very much. And Councillor Carr to Audit and Governance Committee, of course. Uh, other items on the agenda, uh, um, just by force of time, uh, will, will pass automatically. There are no urgent items of business that have been brought to my attention. Therefore, thank you very much, every member. We've, this has not been uh, an easy experience for any of us. It's a very strange experience but it is good to be back together again i declare the meeting closed thank you